Hey, what is going on, guys? Happy Sunday to you. Welcome to Sunday Night Live. We're going to have some fun tonight. Last week, we had Jordan pop in, and he popped right out. He was at Axpona. <laughs> he was at the airport and had horrible Wi-Fi. It was pretty and bad. So, yeah, so I said, Jordan, we got to have you on next week to share a little bit about Axpona. So we're going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about near-field subs. I have received... Uh, a couple of requests from a gentleman. He's like, Michael, can you please talk about this? I need to know. And I just keep forgetting. And so he, he graciously reminded me again last week. He's like, can you ever like address this? I said, yes, man, I, I will make it. Happen. Are you ever going to answer my question? <laughs> yeah. So we're going to talk about near field subwoofers a little bit and how these guys have them set up in their home theater. But before we do that, let me say hi to some folks in the chat. And we will jump right into it. SRW 1000, good to see you. Jed, Brian, as always, Chris is in the house. Finster, Joe, good to see you. Mark, I cope, good to see you, man. Jamie, more folks are joining. Theater Mad, good to see you. Adam, Chris, my home theater, how are you, sir? Chris has got a cool channel. JD, the expert. David, Pedro, all right, man. Lots of folks in the chat. So tonight, like I said, go ahead and if you've got questions regarding home theater, definitely drop those in the um, in the chat. We'll star those, and then later on in the show, we'll start answering those. Of course, super chats are always welcome. They get first priority in that list. So if you drop those, we'll star those as well and hit those as they come in. So first and foremost, man, Jordan, welcome to the show. Good to see you. Jordan and I have become friends guys. over the past probably year, yep. and uh, he's got an awesome home theater uh, channel. And man, you've been hitting the shows, and so <laughs> that is super exciting. I've seen you at several. So as always, we got Jonathan and Ryan. But Jordan, welcome in. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, sorry about last week. It was a it was a crazy <laughs> time at the airport. I was getting my flight got delayed like three times, and then yeah. you know I was trying to was trying to get onto the stream with the Wi-Fi at the at the airport and. It just wasn't happening. So thank you guys for having me back. <laughs> Good to have you, man. I was about to say something. I was like, mm, that went down <laughs> the wrong way. This stuff, you know, it gets, it's a strong drink right here, man. This is a uh, Celsius tropical. Never had that. Oh man. Apparently I can't handle it because <clears throat> it went down wrong. <laughs> Is that so al like actually alcoholic? <laughs> no, I was gonna say. Like, no, it's like a, it's. They, I think they considered an energy drink. But that's a terrible name though, because it's, it just sounds like Tanner. Yeah, I mean it. But these are good, dude. They got them in peach. They got them in. This is more of a fruity kind of tropical flavor, but I figure it's better than lightweight. Yeah, for is, sure. Is it Brian. just like sparkling water that's flavored? Pretty much. Like seltzer yeah. water. I don't think it's yeah. like seltzer, yeah. seltzer water. water. I think it's more, Sparkling, I don't know. Yeah. As the Europeans call it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's good though. I like it, <clears throat> but that's about the only one I'll drink. So, but cool deal, man. So <laughs> it'd be better with some rum. I don't know. I just, I never got into alcohol, man. Nope. Um, I'm barely just, getting into it after what, 30, 38 years. <laughs> yeah. I, I've never, I mean, I've had some wine before and, you know, I think the closest I ever got to being tipsy was back when I was, oh gosh, I was probably 10 years old. And my mom said, you want to try a wine cooler? What kind of childhood <laughs> did you have? <laughs> hey, did he say 10? Yes. I was probably yeah. 10. Yes. Well, here, we, here's we the all, thing. We all heard that correctly. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing. So my mom, when she was alive, her, her thought was, I'd rather you drink around me than go get wasted with your friends. And she always told me, she's like, look, if you want to get drunk, you can do it right here in my home. You know, of course she ain't gonna let me get stupid, but I never did. But, ten? but I tried, I tried a wine cooler. I'm like, mom, I don't feel so good. She's like, you're indoctrinated done. when they're young. <laughs> if you make so, them throw up when they're young, they'll never right? do it again. <laughs> mom was always, I, I guess if she ever got Show into, time. if she ever got into guns, she would be the one that's like, Hey, let me take you shooting. So that it takes the mystery out of it. You know what I mean? And so I think that's been a wild opener to this conversation. <laughs> it is, man. But that's a little insight to, to youth, man. But youth um, man's childhood. Yeah. Alcohol man. and guns. Alcohol and guns. Funny. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, I just, I never, and honestly, um, I, I just saw that that took a hold of part of my mom, you know, most of her life. So 
I think that really pushed me away from alcohol totally. I'm like, I don't need it, man. I, I'm I'm good with my little Celsius drink and and uh, so cool, man. All right, well, guys, like I said, we'll be starring your your comments and questions um, over the course of the show. But Jordan, tell us a little bit about Axfona. That was your first trip this past. Um, was it? Was it it's been a week now. April. Today has been a week. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So um, this past April. So let us know what was that experience like. What'd you see? What'd you hear? Were there some things you liked, didn't like? Ryan <laughs> spent quite a bit last week ranting. I'll, I'll do it again. <laughs> I'm, I'm fueled this time. I'm not exhausted like last time. I was That's a witness. I am ready. He, he was tired. <laughs> I was tired last week. We're, we're fueled up and ready to go. <laughs> so tell, tell us a little bit about it. Well, yes. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. Let me back up. Okay. So for those of you that don't know Jordan, Jordan, getting like a little synopsis of who you are what your channel is about because jordan's got an awesome uh, home theater channel called hater cowboy cinema yeah so i started my channel i think september this year will be two years mm -hmm. i think when i posted my first video so i've been a home theater enthusiast for man since probably since i was right around high school and graduated and you know progressively i started off with the home theater in the box you know super cheap but I've always had a love for home theater and just evolved, you know, my knowledge over time. And I kind of just felt like I was like, you know what? I, I watch a lot of other home theater channels and I don't know everything. I won't profess to know everything. I'm still learning. But I felt like, you know, I know enough that maybe I can help contribute. And there was there were certain things that I was looking for that wasn't on YouTube. So I just decided to, you know, start a channel first videos are, are super horrible can't even go back and watch them i mean just <laughs> first videos are your worst videos man yeah sometimes somebody will comment on a video and i'm like what when was this and i'm like yeah. oh my goodness i can't even watch this but yeah mm -hmm. i'm i love home theater just like you guys guys watching i have you know I, I would say modest home theater i'm i'm growing it evolving it um and then you know i started to as this channel started growing i was like you know what i need to get more reach and I needed to start going out to some of these shows, you know, get some content and because not everybody has the opportunity to do it. I didn't have the opportunity to do it before. And it's only because of, you know, the people that support the channel that, and, and you guys that, you know, enable me to be able to do that. So yeah, I went to Expona and I will say that it probably wasn't, it's probably a different experience just because my first time going there, I was, mainly filming mm -hmm. so i didn't really get a chance to be like you know a consumer dude you were working i, I, I was working a lot <laughs> J just to so yeah. i have my channel that i was filming for i have home theater review that i work for that i got about 10 videos for them and then chris that home theater dude i edit all of his videos and then he works for the grid which mm -hmm. you've probably seen some of my videos on the youtube i edit their videos too so it, it it was a Man, busy you're time, just an but editing machine. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're staying quite busy. So when you go to a show and you're in work mode, that is a totally different mindset. Than, Very different. You know, when I went to Cedia, same thing. It was like we had booked like four a day. You were crazy. You did like what ten in like yeah, a day were, or something? I, yeah. So there were about four a day. So I did ten in two and a half days, basically. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's a different. I, there were times when I did get to sit down Sunday. I had more time, but I was kind of tired, so tired that I was just kind of just like relaxing. But I did get to spend some time in some of the some of the booths, mm -hmm. and it's it's a really really cool experience for those that have gone. You you know, and those who haven't, it's it can be very overwhelming. Uh, just the sheer amount of companies that are there. Like I personally right. didn't realize that there's that many speaker companies that expensive i mean yeah. just mm -hmm. like ridiculous amount mm -hmm. of money i think ryan was talking about there was what was wasn't there some speaker cables that was like three hundred thousand? <laughs> just yeah. a, just the cables that was just what we knew about yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what we what we know about so there's... that's what they had the audacity to publish right there that was, right, right. Yeah. Was written <laughs> on the page who knows the back, what the, the other back page rooms is. they've got some way oh, on well. there yeah so there's stuff like that and then there's speakers that you know, there's million dollar systems where there's two speakers and, you know, two amplifiers. So and then I I know I had a, a video. One of the speakers cost, I think it was a core acoustics. It was like seven hundred thirty thousand dollars. And it's just like it's it's nice, but also it's kind of just like, like, why? 
why does this cost this much? What is, where is the diminishing return at? Like, at what point does it start to be like, okay, the, you know, I'm sure part of it's probably the name and some of the, mm -hmm. some of the materials that they use, but overall, it's a really cool experience. I look forward to going again. And I think next time I go, I'm going to try to actually set aside some time to just be like a viewer mm -hmm. and, you know, take it and all just in. Just enjoy the show. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's hard to balance that. And I guess you just got to go into it. Like I knew going into Cedia, it was just, this was pretty much business. You know, I was yeah. going there to to help content or to help brands get their content out there and get their new products out there. Um, yeah. But it's nice when you can kind of, all right, one day's work, one day's play. Yeah. So that would yeah, be so I do. I got, I got some more that, videos coming on the channel. Was there anything then... that stood out to you, like that you really were impressed so I would say the stuff that I saw, the Dolly speakers were pretty impressive. I, I thought that they sounded uh, really good. Those were 110,000 a piece. They were in a actually. really bad room. It was in like a huge open, yeah. like, yeah, I don't know why they. It's like an I, atrium. Yeah, it was on the lobby. Yeah, it's basically like an atrium, a big open. I actually have a, that video is posting, I think, on Wednesday. I just mm -hmm. edited that video today, so I have a video on that. But yeah, it was in a really bad, mm -hmm. just a huge open area. I don't know why they they had that set up like that, but I mean, it still sounded, sounded good. So I can imagine, at least to me that it would sound even better, you know, in a room. To and paint then, the picture of what those, what the room was like, take like 40 foot ceilings. <laughs> it was probably 40 or 50 feet wide. It was a hotel lobby. Right. Wow. This area was, this part of the lobby was, there was an open side. Like if you're <clears> looking <throat> at the dollies, off to the right, there was like a balcony that went down. So there was even more space over there. From the dollies to the back wall was probably 25 feet. And then off to the left was the hotel reception. And then it opened up back towards the back wall down a long corridor. So this room was enormous. I mean, it was in no way, shape or form conducive <laughs> mm -hmm. to audio at all. Like no. In any way, shape or form, the back wall was floor to ceiling 40 feet windows. high 40 feet wide of just windows nothing yeah. but windows it was a weird spot it was yeah. but the hmm. dollies did really really well and they were powered by yeah. i think it was an m it was 23 uh it was an nad i don't remember the model or a 30 i, I think have it was it. a 23 yeah um, and they did great they were super super loud there was no distortion um they did great yeah, and you guys have sounded... heard me rant from last year about or last <laughs> week about how what my feelings were. I'm going to tell you, the speaker didn't do well. So, uh -huh. which which room was that 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 I met you at? You had just walked out of when you were. We were, were right outside there. the Wilsons. Wilsons, yeah. Okay, so I actually went in there after that, and so they had it pretty low when I went in there, and I was like, oh, it's okay. And then I forget what song it was. It was a rendition of some song, and they turned it up, and then I was kind of, and they didn't even turn it up like really loud, mm -hmm. but I started to kind of get like a little bit of ear fatigue. So I was mm -hmm. like, okay. You know, but when I, when I, when Wilson I met, is super high end. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's, there's crazy expense. And I think one of those rooms had Wilson and like a bunch of audio research, right? Uh, that one was, or was it, who do they usually pair with Wilson? It was those green. Um, no, it, it was Wilson, wasn't it? I'm think, trying to think of the amps. They usually pair with Wilson's somebody in chat's going to be able to name it, but there's yeah. specific amps. <clears throat> And they're not cheap either, but there were two Wilson rooms. There was yeah. that high end one, and then there was a lower end, lower end for Wilson. Good Lord. <laughs> uh, but there were two of the rooms, and Jordan had the exact same reaction I did when I walked in there. I was like, man, these are way too loud. There was just, they were distorting on the high end. Just wasn't a great experience. And I can't really say it was the room because there were other systems that did really well. I mean, look what the Dollies did in that horrific space. So I can't true. really pull any punches based on the room because it was it wasn't that bad. Did you did you get a chance to listen to the Perlison room? Mm -hmm. What did, what were your thoughts on that? Because I heard some people say that they weren't impressed by the S series, but the R series they were, and I guess because it had you know the two subs in it, they're two ten inch. We always say around here that the system that can <clears throat> dig deeper is usually the one you're going to like more. Mm -hmm. So if you're comparing it to the ones that have the dedicated subs. You're definitely going to like the ones with dedicated subs for sure. They weren't distorting, but no, I always like dedicated subwoofers with them. They, Same. I think they wanted to show just the S7Ts in full range is what it came mm -hmm. down to. Right. They did well. Yeah. Not my favorite, but they did well, in my opinion. But say, what were some of your favorite rooms? 
So I would say the other one was the I'm trying to I'm trying to think of specifically. Did you oh, guys run together? Oh, go ahead. I was giving you a little bit of time to come oh, up no. with your idea. I would say the, the Focal Room sounded really good. I mean, those always sound good. But the uh, the, the the Tiva lines, I like those, you know, for an entry level, as they as they call it. Mm -hmm. That sounded really good. Um, and I'm trying to remember, there was a couple other ones that I had. You like the Tiva line, that, the Focal Room? That so that's the first <laughs> that's the first home theater setup that I've heard them in. I've always heard just the towers at the uh, here what, in Houston. What day did you go to the Focal okay. Room? Okay, so <laughs> he's not pulling notes. It's, it's okay. I know if you if you like them. Ryan so didn't like them. We, nice. we 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 cheated because we with home theater review and the grid we got in early before oh. they even let people in to so okay. that we could film and then they they played the demo. So All there right. was there was literally no one in there. Um, but any other time that I tried to go in there, it was just absolutely packed. So I think this plays and shows exactly what can happen. And I think I'm guessing this is what happened when they did your guys's private experience. I'm betting that it was not nearly as loud as when it was for all the mm -hmm. other people in there. What happened when we went in, when the maestros were out, when the utopia in walls were, they were, they were doing the maestro utopia in walls. Then around the corner was the the yeah, Tiva, the or what are they calling them? The Tiva. Tiva. It's a weird spelling, but it's pronounced yeah, Tiva. So Tiva, you'd, you'd <laughs> rotate through those three, and it was like what, three in a row. Well, mm -hmm. what ended up happening is, and I'm assuming this is probably why you had a better experience, when I heard them, they were way too loud, and it was just, you mm -hmm. could hear distortion, the like room correction that was going on with the Tivas like wasn't aligned, and for whatever reason, and maybe it was just for however, however loud they had it, they had foam ceiling panels. Like, why are you trying to demo Atmos speakers, like bouncy house speakers <laughs> with foam ceiling oh, panels? Man. What are you doing? I think that's that's not, and, then, and then one of my friends who was there, Bob, reached up because we were tall and we could touch it and had this like really thin plastic sheeting. Really? It's like, oh, maybe we shouldn't do foam. Let's add really thin plastic sheeting and maybe that will help. With the audio reflections for the bouncy house speaker, it didn't. It, it didn't at all. So, so that was I, my experience. I will say that I didn't, like, when we were in there, they didn't play any, like, actual home theater, like, content. It was just yeah music. So that yeah. sounded good. I didn't actually get to experience the, I mean, they said it was Atmos music, but I never heard any um at most effects but i also didn't really sit down in the middle because i was filming so i can't talk about that part but as far as everything else that i that i heard in there it sounded it sounded good but like i said i didn't get a chance to hear the home theater part but everything else sounded good but again there was nobody in there they didn't they weren't they weren't definitely weren't blasting it do i need a hug <laughs> He got a little worked up there, didn't he? I, I, this stream, like He's I'm resting, and recovered. This is yeah. I'm going to be unloading tonight on this stuff. It's my headphones were distorting with that yell. I know <laughs> he was clipping that mic. <laughs> Sorry, oh, mercy, man. But uh, I, I'm trying to think of one other one that I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Like I'm saying, man, it was I, I was I got oh the KLHs. Those sounded good. KLHs. Where were those? Those were on the f fourth floor. I don't I remember those. It was either third or fourth, but they had yeah, the new. I, I think they're bottle sevens. They look just like the Clips Heritage line. I didn't hear but, those. Yeah, that that the room was really probably good. really busy. Yeah. yeah. So you're struggling to find rooms that you liked. I think is really <laughs> indicative of how I felt yeah. about the whole show. <clears throat> Tell me about some. It, Let's not say rooms or names okay. of speakers. <clears throat> you can kind of give me the what the speaker looked like, maybe. <laughs> it's a big, ugly, purple, green horn. It's a salad bowl. I mean, give me. <laughs> it had these three letters on the front. <laughs> <laughs> I won't mention the brand, but. Um... What was, what was, <clears throat> what did you see happening in a lot of the rooms? Like what, overall with the show, what was your feeling of, a lot of the rooms so i know a lot of people like 
there were rooms that were overcrowded. Most mm -hmm. of them, I guess I just picked really good times where there wasn't a whole lot of people in there. Well, when you can go to the show before it opens, I mean, that's super. That yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. That, yeah, so, but I will say that when I went into some of the rooms, they just had it playing just way too loud. Like, to mm -hmm. where I was just like, man, like, this is just, like, this isn't enjoyable. Mm -hmm. um, it was too loud. And then, you know, you get, like, distortion and stuff like that. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I felt like, they didn't, some rooms didn't turn it up loud enough. I'm like, this is like, turn it up, man. I want to hear the speaker. I want to hear the system. You know, we've got these powerful amps, these, you know, hundreds of thousand dollars speakers and amps. And honestly, for me, some of, most of it was kind of underwhelming. And I don't know if that was just my experience because I was filming a lot, but the few times that I did sit down, I can't really say that I was like, very impressed other than the rooms that you know i talked about mm -hmm. um and i know i talked to some other people too and a lot of people's seems like a lot of people was uh consistent was that most of the rooms weren't that impressive and or it was just just turned up way too loud so let me say this ask this question did you feel that the more recognizable names <clears throat> that were backed like the big names like that you would typically think and associate with brands with home theater. And there's a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. My feeling was those brands represented better than a lot of the other brands I'd never heard of. Kind I of felt good. like they did decently well, maybe not phenomenally where I was blown away, <laughs> but I felt like they weren't distorting. They, a lot of them ran room correction, did setups, did had acoustic treatments, had a bunch of stuff. And I felt like a lot of the no name ones, not no name, but more, People that don't Boutique know. brands, I'll say. Maybe they sell a couple speakers a year. Maybe that's why they're charging a million dollars because they only sell one or so. I don't know. Um, but I felt like... <laughs> <laughs> no, that room... So I, I forgot about Hope that room. sounded great. Okay. No, no the, I think that's what R2, I'm saying. They the sound R200s, good Yeah, that room, I forgot about that. That room, <clears throat> like for me, that room stole the show. I'm not saying that they sounded the best, but they stole yeah. the show because... When I went in there, I the guy that was in there, Ryan, I met him at Cedia and I filmed with him. So we got mm -hmm. together and I went in there and I was just waiting. And when I walked in, they were doing a demo and I, I looked around the room and I was like, okay, there's no subs in here, but this there was speaker nothing should, in there yeah, except this like speaker a should not be sounding thing. like this. Yeah. And so I look, I look back at Ryan. I'm like, dude, are you sure there's no subs? He's like, no, I'm like, this sounds incredible. So that room sounded great. I, I will agree with you though, Ryan. And I think, I think for me, part of that is because a lot of those brands, those, the, you know, your typical box brands that, you know, they've been doing this for so long. They know how to set it up. For instance, I went into SVS. They were one of probably two companies that had a complete home theater setup. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to, I forget what his name is, but he was saying, he was like, yeah, we set up in like 30 minutes Larry. to an hour now. No, it wasn't Larry or Nick. It was the, I forget yeah, the other the guy. guy's name. Yeah, yeah, and I have a video with him, but he was like, we, we've we done this so many times that setup takes Kind hardly, of turnkey for them. Yeah. Yeah. They and that exactly room, need to do. Yeah. even though it wasn't your, like your two channel room, that room sounded amazing. Like SVS sounded really good. They were playing movie demos at right. Expo. Yeah. But I was like, dang, this, this is the first time I've actually heard, not yeah. the first time, but like, at the other shows at Cedia, you know, I didn't really get to hear it, but I sat in there for a little bit and mm -hmm. that room was rocking. Nice. So I think it depends on how how often those companies go there and just having the knowledge of knowing how to set up, knowing how to make the room work with their their speakers. And yeah, I don't even know if SVS had like, did they have acoustic treatment in there? I didn't I go into that room. It was oh, okay. really busy when we went, went by it. <clears throat> but yeah, um, I think it seems like that, and I don't know if was it how many times have you been, Ryan, to Expona? This was my first year. It was your first year? Okay, so mm -hmm. I don't have anything to compare it to, and I know other people were saying that in some of the previous years, like it sounded, I guess there was a better experience. I don't, I Maybe don't know. We're more educated. Yeah. But Maybe we've been doing our work, <laughs> educating <laughs> <Ryan>. people. <laughs> So yeah, next year I'm definitely going to go into like the super niche expensive ones to see like, okay, how does this sound? Because I heard mm -hmm. Estelon, uh, I, didn't, I didn't hear it, but I heard a lot of people like the Estelon mm -hmm. uh, booth. They really like that. I think that was the million dollar room. They have like the the drivers that like can move up <laughs> and down. Right. It's crazy. Um, that home theater dude has a, has a video on that one where it shows that. But 
yeah, I, I think next year I'll be, you know, if I go next year, I'll definitely take some time out to, oh, well, now I'll have something to compare it to, you know? Yeah, sure. And how many times have you been, Michael? I have never been to Axe I was supposed to go, mm. goodness, what was it? He bailed Did out. You? No, it was, it was basically the year that, you know, COVID happened. 2020. <clears throat> yeah, and then I think I was going to go 2021, but then. It didn't happen. I, yeah, so I wasn't able to make that. I think I had a scheduling conflict that that week and then we started <clears throat> excuse me we started uh m wave and so then that kind of consumed a lot of my time getting that ready and one thing i love about trade shows and, and av shows is it gives you the consumer an opportunity just to hear some things some brands and have some experiences <clears throat> that maybe you just never heard of like you said you you heard some speaker manufacturers you've never been presented with you know um, sometimes you go in there and, and it's an amazing demo. A lot of times, unfortunately, it's not. And I think that's one thing that we're striving to do with M-Wave is to make sure that we have rooms that you come in and, and are just very, very enjoyable experiences. I mean, the last thing we want you to do is walk in and go, man, that sucked. You yeah, know, because then Michael's just going to point at me and like, you didn't do your job. I'm lying. What happened, bro? I was doing the marketing. I'm you're... hyping this crap up and you're just letting everybody down is what he's going to do. Uh, but yeah, man. And speaking of that, I mean, you're going to uh, be joining us for M-Wave this year. So we're super pumped about that. This is our second year doing it. We'll be there July the 14th through the 16th if you're in the chat and you haven't heard about M-Wave. Definitely check out all the details there on the website, MidwestAVExperience.com. But our goal is quite a bit different than mm -hmm. what you've experienced at Expona, what I experienced at Cedia. Um, most of the time, those shows are geared for two channel. And really, there's not a lot out there that, that have really great home theater experiences. And that's mainly my passion. Uh, Ryan's got an incredible home theater. Jonathan's got an incredible home theater. The folks in Kansas City, I think everybody owns a home theater up there, you know, so um, it just made sense to try to build something from the ground up that was primarily focused on home theater. We want to have some two channel experiences, too, and some video experiences and, and all these other things. But we really want to create like my heart this year. And we're working towards this. We got several brands that are already doing this. Um, SVS being one of them, they're going to put a, together a full Dolby Atmos uh, system. Um, pull this up real quick, and I'll show you. So I have, I have, um, a, I have a question real quick yeah, about do, the M Wave. So yeah, that'll be my first time going to Kansas City. I'm gonna I'm gonna brag here a little bit. So yeah, I know Texas has some really good barbecue, and I've oh, heard Kansas City has. Nah, Texas ain't so. nothing, man. <laughs> <laughs> have you had Texas barbecue? I haven't. I'm just messing with you. Yeah, What's, so check, check this out. So we've got 7.2.4. They're going to bring the Prime Pinnacles, mm -hmm. which that's kind of cool because think about this. The Prime Pinnacles isn't their flagship speaker. And so SVS is willing to bring their, I don't want to say their entry-level speaker, but basically not their top tier. They're going to bring the Ultra Center. They've got the Prime Bookshelves, four Prime Elevation, which they're known for. They make great elevation speakers and height speakers. And then they're going to bring two of the PB16s. They'll also have a two channel set up in their room. Um, so I'm super pumped about that. They're going to have a full fledged 7.2.4 Dolby Atmos system set up there. You may want to tell them to bring more subs though. Four, four of them. Yeah. Well, the room's so large. It's I think they're going to need more lower low end. And it's just um, going to, it's going to work out better for them if they can bring <clears throat> more, more grunt. So per listen is going to be there as well. We just got off a meeting with um, their main distributor. Yeah. Um, so we talked about kind of some thoughts they had, their ideas. They're probably going to have a room for the S series. They're going to have a totally separate room for the R series. Um, I don't know if both of those will be full Dolby Atmos setups, but one of them will. And so we're really pumped about that. So you'll get a chance to hear a Dolby Atmos system there. JTR is going to have a full fledged, massive <laughs> setup here. So we've got seven of these 212 RTs, which are those right there. He's going to have six of these surrounds. Uh, I'm sorry, height speakers. And then we've got four of these massive <clears throat> Captivator 4000 ULF, the tall versions. 
So that room's going to be insane. Jonathan, are you la laughing because I'm going to have more 4,000s in my room than he's going to have? <laughs> That's not what I was laughing at, but that deserves a laugh. Yeah. No, I just have been to Jeff's shows before. I know how he, lay, he lays into that volume. He yeah, explicitly he made, him and Nick explicitly made us ask, will they make us turn it down? Yeah. And I got it in writing that says no. They can say no now until they hear Jeff at the volume control. <laughs> they said no, and it is in writing. Uh, so that that's their problem. I'm excited Mark, to hear. Martin JT Logan's going to have a setup there. Man, we've just got, I mean, so when you look at something like Axe Bonus, Cedia, a lot of these other big shows, you know, they've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of vendors. We don't. What we're really focused on is that experience. We really want to provide some things that, that these other you know, and nothing wrong with these other uh, trade shows, but we want to provide something that's unique, different to the space. And really what we focus on is relationships, experiences that you're not going to get anywhere else. Like we're going to take two um, big screens. We're going to have multiple projectors to be able to compare side by side. Uh, Ryan's putting together a tactile transducer, which is notice how he in. keeps throwing me out there and <laughs> yeah. alienating himself. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan's going to do this. I'm Ryan's going to do I'm this. Hype man, I'm bro. just pitching it. Ryan's going to do this so that if it falls flat on its face, it wasn't me. It was him. It was hey, this guy hey over you here. told me you don't want me. Uh, you're like, we're freeing Michael up so he can just film and document and have some fun. So, but yeah, so we really, we're just, we're going to have a blast with it. So we're excited. So if you guys can make it, we'd love to have you out. Um, July 14th through the 16th. All the details are on the website, MidwestAVExperience.com. And I think that transitions very well into what one of our topics is for tonight, which is tactile transducers. And so where I was going with that. Oh, we're done is... talking about Expona. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think Ryan's done talking about Expona. <laughs> See, in my brain, I'm just thinking, man, how do you make this flow? Transition? Michael had a Linus Tech Tips ready segue <laughs> going in from when Jordan said, hey, about M-Wave. And Michael's like, segue. Let's do this. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, man. I try to. Uh, that's just the way my brain thinks. Mm -hmm. It's like, how do I make it as smooth of a transition? And Sorry, I was the train wreck that happened management. in that smooth transition. That's hilarious, dude. Did they have any Magico stuff there? Did you guys see that? Magico like 30, was there. $30,000 subwoofers made out of mm. aluminum block. I didn't, I didn't see I that. don't think they had subs there, though. They had their speakers. I wasn't. Their sub-18 weighs 570 pounds, and it's like Goodness. it's carved aluminum, if I recall right. correctly. It's... It's a wild, it's a wild product. <laughs> Thirty-two thousand bucks, I think. That's yeah. Probably just the cost of the aluminum block. <laughs> <clears throat> so what else on M-Way? I mean, not <laughs> <laughs> on Expona. On Expona? Um, Any other thoughts? What was your favorite room, Jordan? And while you do this, I'm gonna go grab something. I'll be right back. Michael doesn't even care anymore. Just no, no, no. I just got, I need to grab something, dude. This like, we're not about M-Wave. I'm out. I'm gone. <laughs> Hey, full transparency, we're going to be on here a while, and this room gets crazy hot. Because oh, when they when they enclosed my office, they didn't put a return vent here. Ooh. Or like a, yeah, I guess it's a return vent. So we got air blowing in, but it just it it just gets hot. And Michael so go, radiates heat. I do, man. I'm sweating right now, man. It's mm -hmm. I got these big lights right here. So I will we're be like right like 40 back. degrees today. You're at Florida. How hot is it in Florida it's right eight, now? It's like, it's like 85 I think 40 degrees. It can't be that 38 much. this morning. I think I mean, it warmed up in the day, but I'll be right back. <laughs> all right. Yeah. My favorite room. I think my favorite room was the, and I know this doesn't make sense because it's nothing compared to the other speakers, how much they cost, but the R200 to me, just really impressed me. Like that was a really good room. It, it was like, I, I can't emphasize enough and you can only experience it there, but I, that was my first time hearing them, and I know others have talked about how awesome they were. Like that, I was blown away by how much bass that they were outputting, and how they didn't just like they turned it up. It was pretty loud, and it wasn't distorting at all. So that was my favorite room. Um, I won't say that it was the most impressive, but just because of what they were able to do in that size room and those speakers, like that was my favorite. What was what about the most you? impressive to you? <clears throat> Well, before you answer that, what was my favorite room? Hmm. I'm going to let you answer the next question before I answer, because I got to think about that one. <laughs> um, I would say the dollies, just because like we talked about, 
they were just in a absolutely horrible environment. And I remember mm -hmm. when I told them to, to turn it up so that I could, you know, try to get some B-roll, I was like, man, that sounds good. And yeah, I mean, just that was probably the most impressive one. And I mean, there are huge, <clears throat> huge speakers and paired with those, you know, those NADs, it's, it mm -hmm. sounded really good. Again, I, I, I spent most of my time working and I can't really speak on the other stuff that I was in there because I didn't really get a chance. Like I heard it, but I wasn't sitting down listening just to listen, but the dollies I did actually get to sit down and listen to. And I, mm -hmm. I thought those were very impressive. So well, my, you need, to, you need to consider doing two days at M-Wave then. That way one day you can just have yeah. fun. And then one day if you want to work, you can work. Friday and Saturday or Saturday, Sunday, maybe. My favorite yeah. room. <clears throat> the Polks were really pretty good. Yeah. And Polk kind of had a falling out where a lot of people don't really associate them. It's not a name that comes with rolling I, off right. the tongue when you talk yeah. about high fidelity audio That's anymore. So I think it should be given what they showcased <clears throat> there. They did really, really well. Um, what else did did I really really like? I wanna I wanna stop you guys for a second. Are you talking the Reserve R two hundred? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, and it's the anniversary edition. I don't know what the difference is, but they made a point of saying that it was. The it R200 is, but I think it's the non anniversary has the same spec. Okay. I think it's just the finish. Oh so yeah, I, I know why it's anniversary because it has a serial it's serial numbered. So. Yes. Uh, I haven't heard those speakers, so I won't. I won't cast judgment, but I'm looking at the specs online. Frequency spawns 51 hertz to 38,000 hertz. Sensitivity 86 dB. Recommended amplifier 30 to 200. One when I speed, say they have bass, like, okay. what we about here? <laughs> it had the Ryan dry bass. Like it <laughs> hit it like 80 hertz, right? It was enough to give you that chest thump. But and let me back up here because I need to preface this whole thing. When the bar is set so low that it is off the frame of the camera, <laughs> virtually anything, He's regardless of what it is, yeah. that performs moderately well may be perceived as a showstopper. Okay, so this could be highly swayed given what was happening there, but they did well, and I'll say... They did very well in comparison to the majority of the other things that were at the show. Right. Yeah. I'll say it that way. And with all fairness, I was I I'm about to say I reserved that. I reviewed <clears throat> the reserve series and I was very impressed with it. I mean, it wasn't like the most amazing speaker I've ever heard no. in my life. They had a really, really good sound, very balanced sound to them. They weren't bright, they weren't overly boomy. They've got good, you know, bottom end, but I had their towers along with the R two hundred. So and but. for me personally, I've I've had numerous pokes. They've always been very bright for me. Like mm -hmm. I can't turn them up very loud, and it starts to like hurt. Those yeah. speakers didn't sound like that. Yeah. But I, I really think that it could have been that everything was so <laughs> down here. The bar kept going lower and lower, and you walk in. You go, maybe right. anything could have right. done well. I think my favorite room. Do your with, favorite room and then do probably your probably the F two hundreds. Which ones were those? Martin Logan F two hundreds. Did I hear the Martin Logan? You had to not be in the front row because there was a massive knoll in the front row. If you stood up and went to the second row, all the bass came back. What floor was that on? Six. I don't think I heard those. Or five. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in there. I really liked the F two hundreds. So I think they did really well. There was another speaker in one of the big rooms downstairs, mm -hmm. but I don't remember what. Maybe you do. It was like a traditional JBL-looking cabinet. It was in one of the big rooms downstairs. It had a front port, and they were playing more like EDM music. JBL. They were pulled out from the wall. They weren't JBLs, but they looked like a traditional JBL, like old like school a, 70s or 70s cabinet with the big 12 inch driver. And then you had like a tweeter up here and a mid range or this mid range and then the port down here. And it was, they did extraordinarily well for how big that room was. You could hear some port chuffing because they were getting driven hard, but there was no level of distortion. God, I wish I, wish I could remember what the name of what, those speakers were. Around what area was it? Was it the. Like, was it going towards where you sign in? 
or before that or past that? <clears throat> I want to say it was down across from the three hundred and thirty thousand dollar cable room. OK, see, I, I didn't go like across that the hall. So they did really well. And as far as anything else, the dollies were pretty good, especially for the room that they were in. The and worst. I, Go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say. So <laughs> I was editing that video today and they said that they do like 12 layers of like wood. So they basically build them like like symphony type stuff, like drums and like. Uh, they're a gorgeous you know. speaker. The dollies. Yeah, they're 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 very gorgeous. They're very well built. But. I was also going to ask you what was your overall experience of Exponent since that was your first time also. Mm. <laughs> I'll just let that. I won't say anything. <laughs> no, let's let's let go that back say, say everything. I'd go back, but I'd probably go. I'm going back because I'm in the industry. Like if I wasn't yeah. in the industry, it would depend like, on how hard, how deep into the industry, like how love much love i have for the the space mm -hmm. and how much i really wanted it to be better next year <laughs> or maybe i sustained really bad hearing loss and i couldn't hear all the distortion um i'll go back but what was my overall feeling of the show on the scale of one to ten I'm not going to answer wow. that. Wow. <laughs> wow. He really didn't like wow. that. Wow. <laughs> he scared of that one, man. Uh, I, I there was just two. There was just. I think it was eye opening for a lot of people, especially that the more enthusiast group crowd that there's just a lot of butt out there. Yeah. And not a lot of. <laughs> Jonathan, people have just you make things. They just buy drivers off like parts. Like there are speakers. If you know your drivers and stuff well enough, you can walk up and look at certain speakers and be like, they bought that off of Parts Express. Mm -hmm. And then really? they're charging 50 right. times yeah. what that thing costs. And it's, but for the people that they're selling it to, they don't know. They don't know and yeah. so I think a big reason that these things cost so much is because the thing, like they're putting these exotic materials into them and they may only sell, and this is a guess, I really don't know, a couple pair maybe Compared a pair of other year. brands yeah a lot yeah. less but. yeah but they're using exotic materials <laughs> and stuff and it's there's no reason for that speaker to cost that much it just does especially given the speaker technologies and development and things that went into it i view a lot of those as just people buy them because they can yeah not because, I, would, I would agree with and that. they sit in a corner and not really do anything except be eye candy and a lot of these systems that's how i view them um that's how i view a lot of the systems that were there unfortunately so i guess that's kind of my view of the show it was very much a two channel show most of the rooms had two had turntables you walk in and it's playing like the same stuff to me old like school jazz and then yeah. you ask them to change to like rock and they look at you like why would I do that? <laughs> and if, then as soon as they do that, the speaker just goes and just falls apart and can't handle anything. So you're kind of thinking, are you just playing smooth jazz because your speaker can't do anything else? And it's just masking its inability to really do anything? Or are you trying to cater to an audience? Because in a lot of these rooms, as soon as it plays something other than smooth jazz... It just <laughs> falls apart. It falls flat on its face. <laughs> well, that's funny that you say that because I, I went in one room and I was asking them to play some demo material and they were like, what do you want to hear? Do you want to hear like, you know, classical rock? And I was like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm down with rock. And I was like, how about Metallica? And they were like, uh, that's let's that's hear the Bee Gees. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, I was like, okay. The Bee Gees. <laughs> <laughs> there was Bob, Bob went into one room and he asked the guy to play something. He was playing like smooth jazz or classical or something. Mm -hmm. And then he just asked him, hey, can you play something maybe a little more intense with a little like more intense bass? And he turned on classical music with like a drum. <laughs> and it's like, no, that's not what I wanted at all. I'm and I'm going to do it. So it just makes you feel like they're trying to do things that are masking mm -hmm. what probably it, it, inadequacies of the equipment and i think another problem that was there is you get a lot of 
I told you I came prepared this time. I've, I've got my energy. I'm ramped up. I think another issue that maybe was present was they're driving a lot of these systems with boutique amplifiers. And a lot of these amplifiers are tubes. And I'm guessing, and I didn't ask a lot of questions about the amps, but I'm guessing that part of the problems that we're running into with the speakers was the amps were being overdriven. And you're running into clipping, and maybe these amps were only capable of like four watts. And the the level that these guys are pushing these speakers to, the amplifiers like, ah, I can't do it! And it's just freaking out. And then on the verge of blowing itself up, and we're just hearing it cry for mercy as it, attempts to not blow up in the room and set off all the smoke alarms and send yeah. us out to the parking lot. Yeah. Oh, I, and I did, I just remembered the, the Bowers and Wilkins with the Macintosh amps, that room sounded pretty good too. At least I thought now that was also one room where they were playing it too loud. And I actually had to ask them to turn it down so that I could Which interview. Room? So it was on the, you know, where they had the big Mac stack, like the huge Macintosh mm -hmm. speakers, like right on the side of that, that room that, that was behind those speakers they had like all the new bowers and wilkins oh yeah yeah so they had that in there and they had the i think they had some new tube amps some yeah tube the amps. bowers and wilkins did decently well as far as not distorting my problem that i had with the bowers and wilkins room is it seemed like you could distinctly hear the mid-range not being able to keep up with the tweeter like it was the tweeter was like way out there and bright and like Bowers and Wilkins are. And and it's like, I'm going to have my own. Like, oh my moment. God, please warn me next time so I can take my <laughs> like, off. I know um, what it sounds like. But the, the, um, the mid-range just wasn't able to keep up. It kind of fell apart on certain songs and you could plainly hear it. It didn't blend well. But they um, were driving them pretty loud in there. They like were. I said, I had to tell, I had to ask them Cause I was interviewing a couple of people and they were just blasting. And I was like, Hey man, can you, can y'all turn it down? And one of the guys was like, oh, I, I, I guess I could turn it down. I don't really want to mess up the system. I'm like, well, I mean, the I can't volume? film in here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Somebody yeah. said <clears throat> Siphonics audio said, I guess it's all how we ask my buddies and play rooms, whatever I ask for. Yeah. There were plenty of rooms that did that and they would move and change music. But a lot of those rooms, they didn't have a problem changing music, but as soon as they changed music, my butt, a lot of times, waited a few seconds to be polite and then got out of the chair and left the room because mm -hmm. it, it opened up a lot of shortcomings of the speaker when you turn different things on that maybe were a little bit louder and had a more of a larger dynamic range. <laughs> we need to take to Ryan's subjective opinions with a great... Yeah, probably. Uh, these are all subjective opinions, guys. Yeah. I'm not walking yeah. in there with a clipple mm -hmm. and going around and measuring all the speakers. Right. And No, nah, this is all subjective. Very so, subjective. So would you say it would benefit the user or the consumer to have like a more educated, like you walk into the room and say, hey, we know these speakers are super expensive, but this is the type of music that this speaker is designed for. Like if, you, if you're if you looking for, you know, a multi-speaker where you can listen to jazz, rock, like this probably isn't the speaker. I'm of the opinion, In, and Jonathan, I think I you'll agree with me, that a good speaker should be yeah. able to do everything. Right. Yeah. But if your speaker's... Like you said, if your speaker can't do that, I feel like yeah. they should just be forthright and say, "Hey, but you we... know that's not ideal yeah. for our speakers." <laughs> but I mean, they're not—they're not, not going to say that. But... Yeah, because... You mean you don't want to say, "Hey, guys, our speaker's actually not that good." <laughs> <laughs> well, it's don't better than lying to people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, I'm gonna get so many cease and desist <clears throat> from the Clark that I said. Yeah, you guys definitely don't even give Ryan any hands, uh, man, because he'll start buying stuff on the stream. But Jonathan, you said you've been before. So what's what's your experience? I've been too. I, w I went to 2017 and 2019, and I actually like audio, so I enjoyed my trip. I uh... <laughs> you went <Zing>. what? <laughs> what? Say that again. I didn't. He hear actually it. likes audio. Uh, but he enjoyed his time there. I like. <laughs> it was fun. I just. Yeah. I think one thing that I did come away with on that is that. I had never been around speakers that cost eight hundred thousand dollars or three hundred thousand yeah. dollars or you sure. know just the incredibly high end stuff. <laughs> and Definitely I, not I, I did expect more from the really high end stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. if I'm going to pay almost a million dollars for a setup, I'd like it to sound a lot different than my setup I have at the house. Yeah, but don't sure. you consider really high end also to be most of the rooms, which are fifty thousand dollars or so for speakers? And that's most a lot. of the rooms are very high. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you got out of there, a, a cheap room was three or four thousand dollars for the speakers, I, kind of more and more or less. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I like you guys. I, there were some not, diamonds in the rough, in my opinion. When I went, I liked the Elac room, and those are fairly inexpensive speakers comparatively. Um, but there were some neat ones too, like mm -hmm. the Avant Garde. I'm trying to, I, I might be mispronouncing that, but they were the giant horns, like huge plastic um, horns. I didn't get to hear they were those. Fun. I wish I, I could have. Were they there? The, they were know. there. I looked up the vendor. Okay. They, they could, they come in any color and they're just eye candy. And, mm -hmm. and that horn has got a real nice high end compression driver behind it. And it sounds good. It's kind of like a, I'm probably going to get crucified here a little bit, but it's kind of a JTR sound, like a real clean treble sound. And um, I enjoyed that. So there's there's some diamonds in there. You just got to wade through a lot of muck. There absolutely are. There were yeah. some great experiences there. It's just don't go to Exponent thinking, man, this is high end gear. Every room is going to be amazing. Is not. And it's not, and that's yeah. uh, literally. I mean, I try to to share with all of my audience like the best thing you can do is try to hear as many speakers and and brands as you possibly can because it's the only way you're going to know for your own self what you like. All four of us can go into a room, listen to the same set of speakers, and we may come out with four different opinions on it. Sure. You know, um, based on our preferences, our hearing, um, and not just like good hearing versus bad hearing, but I, I really believe that we all hear quite differently, you know, to what somebody would consider, man, that's just really bright and kind of like nails on a chalkboard might be very detailed and, you know, kind of awesome to you and so really by getting in front of these and hearing as many as you can then you can kind of figure out okay what are your ears like and then figure out okay is the price does the price justify what you're hearing because sometimes you can find something that has a similar sound isn't quite as expensive but you're still as enjoyed you know by listening to it and experiencing that so i got so a little think, analogy here on that because you, yeah, you know we, we say that there's people like different speakers when they hear the same thing. And, and mm -hmm. I think even for a long time, I had a hard time understanding that, like even believing it. But, but if you think about it, like what's your favorite female vocalist, Michael, who's your, who's your favorite? Um, man, I don't want to put you on the spot. If you don't, if you can't think off the top of your head, but for like my, Taylor like, Swift. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, wow. just cut off the speed right now. <laughs> no, no, literally there's a girl, I'm serious, there's a girl named Allison Luff. Mm -hmm. um she My does a rendition of waitress and i was on a home theater tour one day and this guy played it was this I the one in kansas in, city i think he might have played it in that room. you could only find on youtube that you listen to repeatedly yeah, <laughs> yeah. i haven't contacted them and i said is there any way i can get like the flack version of this thing so i can just listen to it over and over i won't sell it i promise i just want to enjoy it like the highest resolution possible and never heard back good. I know, I know you're it's beautiful about. but it's allison right. luff um and it's called waitress and it, i guess it's from a um play a musical a musical but yeah so that's she's got an, a beautiful beautiful voice so underlying point being you could ask all four of us our favorite female vocals and it won't be the same thing and you could mm -hmm. ask a room of 40 guys and you might get a couple you know mm -hmm. things that would bubble to the top but there's going to be a lot of different favorites that's the correct. same as this truth with speakers as well yeah. um you know you might get a couple favorites in a room full of guys but each are going to have their own preferences yeah. Yep. hundred percent. You know, Brad, he's saying like, you know, his ears don't like too much treble, but he loves the bass, you know, and some people are the opposite. Sometimes they hear too much bass and go, I want something kind of more subtle. I just want something just to fill in the bottom end, but I don't want it to reach out and grab me and shake me like some of those um, speaker setups do. I don't know what you're talking about, about <laughs> Ryan's bass. like, that is not me at all. <laughs> We sure, man. Let's look at some of the comments here. Well, sweet, man. But well, I, I appreciate you guys sharing your experiences on Expona. Um, you know, and I think there's some great, great trade shows out there. There's some great AV events. Um, you know, I'll be going to um, Audio Advice Live. Of course, we've got M Wave coming up. I'll be at CD again this year. So I look forward to them, man. I look forward to connecting with you guys. If you're going to be at any of those shows, definitely come up and say hi to us. You know, I know um, Siphonics mentioned that he saw Ryan, but didn't walk up and say hi. But definitely approach us, man. Come say hi. We'd love to connect with you. Speak for yourself. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He's a really cool dude, too. I got to meet him, Joseph. Yeah. So we were friends yeah. on, uh, on, on Instagram. We, you know, messed us sometimes. But he's, he's a really cool dude. And, he is. And very um, tall. I told him that. I was like, man, same thing with Ryan. I was like, 
man, Ryan, how tall are you? Like five inches taller than me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The dudes in Kansas city, man, they're all tall. Jonathan's super <laughs> tall, man. All those guys. Well, sweet, man. Well, let's transition into um, one of the topics that one of my subscribers asked about, and it's how do you calibrate for um, near-field subwoofers? And for the most part, a near-field subwoofers, when you take like right behind Jonathan's seat, do you have them set up still, Jonathan? I just have the little babies back there right now. <clears throat> okay. Because I know he's, his, his things are in transition, but you can see he's got three subwoofers. I'm going to blow him up here. He's got three subwoofers right behind you know, a subwoofer behind each seat. And typically whatever size of that driver is, you want to not have that subwoofer any further distance from your back than the size of the driver. So if you got an 18 inch, you just don't want to put it any further than 18 inches from you. Um, and so, but one of the questions was like, how do you calibrate that? I mean, that is that something that you can hook up to Odyssey and it, it's going to figure that out? Or is there some other process that you use in your setup? And I know Ryan has near field in his, Jonathan has them in his. Uh, Jordan, do you have any near field subwoofers? No, my room doesn't allow me to have them directly behind me, but my PP4000 is like, it's about five feet behind me and it does give me a little bit of that sensation. But unfortunately, I don't just, I don't have the setup to do that. Better okay. read the room. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about that a little bit. Like how would you, if somebody wanted to go down that rabbit hole of adding near field <clears throat> subwoofers to their setup to get more of that tactile base, um, how do you dial that in? Because, you know, my brain thinks if I've got a subwoofer that's 18 inches from me, I'm going to, the whole time I'm going to be watching a movie and I'm going to be thinking, man, I hear that subwoofer right behind me because it's so close, but I've been to both of your home theaters and that is not the case. And so I know that you've dialed in those. So kind of walk us through maybe your process. I know we can't go step by step, but give us a general overview of what that looks like. Are there other components that we need to kind of aid in that process of dialing that in? Sure. I think this is going to be a little different for everybody. And I don't think that there's necessarily like a right 100%. answer. <clears throat> it's going to be some subjective preference dialed in as well. You were talking about how do you keep the ones from behind you from being uh, more like a, you know that they're behind you. Right. What I do is just run my front subs about a dB, a single dB louder than my rear subs, and that takes care of that. The sound stage still comes from the front. Nice. But you okay. get that impact and that feel from the rear. So one thing I want to talk about as well, if you let auto EQ have its way with your near field subs directly behind you, it may mm -hmm. do some wild and zany things with the frequency response because you, the near field is right next to your back and the mic where your head would be, would be kind of off angle, right? N not kind of, it would basically be 90 degrees up. And yeah. so your frequency response is not going to look real great. If you're trying to calibrate for frequency response at that position, it's probably not going to be ideal. So what I've found is I prefer to not EQ my mm -hmm. near field subs and just let them play the raw signal. So if you have Odyssey, you can curtain it off to where it mm -hmm. doesn't affect uh, right. subwoofer bank too so you need a little bit higher end receiver because the cheap receivers just why split a single subwoofer out but mm -hmm. if you have a maybe they start at like five or six hundred bucks maybe seven hundred what ryan we might have a better beat on this than i do but where you have two distinct subwoofer two outs, independent where can, subwoofer <clears throat> level where it can do distances where it can do eq where it can do levels um you would want two specific unique subwoofer outs and your and your far field subs can be on subwoofer one if you have more than one, you can either use like a mini DSP to EQ them, or you can put them equidistant from the listening position. Like mm -hmm. if you have two subs in the sub bank one, you can put them up front, left and right, um, side, left and right, whatever you want to do. Just keep them equidistant from the listening position. That'll take care of the phase and so forth. And then your subwoofer two, your tactile near field subs, they'll, you can just shut off the EQ on that particular output. And, and it'll sum well, like, even though the near field may not measure the best at your seats, your front subs will cover that. You won't have a problem there. Now, as far as processing, I'm going to share my screen for a second. I'll just show yeah, you go ahead. what I do. While you're doing that, this is a great question here. So, and we're going to actually try to tackle this at M-Wave. So near field sub versus something like a butt kicker. So that's a great question, man. So let me minimize this. All right. Can you guys see my screen right now? Yeah. Yep. All right, so I do not use I I don't use e Odyssey e EQ on my system at all. I I basically just do a little bit of manual EQ, and I kind of use a little bit of a smiley face because that's my preference for sound. So just a tiny bit. It's like a dB up on the le left side on the bass end, and a dB up on the right side, 
and like a half dB down in the middle. It's just like kind of a little small curve like that. That's for my main speakers. For my subs, I don't do, I have eight 18 inch drivers. So I don't mm -hmm. need to use PEQ because the sum of them does what I need them to do in the room. So I don't have to, I found I don't really have to apply parametric EQ. Okay. So what we're gonna look at here is, and this is, this is, let's go back and rewind my system probably like two months before I got these seats because my system's in a state of um, change, change right now. Yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't know what it'll end up, but this is going with what I had before. Okay. I had, I have eight channels of iNuke driving eight 18 inch subwoofers and I have each channel that limited to 1600 watts at four ohms. So that's right. my limiter. Okay. I have no PEQ, no high, I'm sorry, we'll get to PEQ in a minute. I have no high pass and low pass. They're sealed subs, so it's just all off. Mm -hmm. My parametric EQ, all my subs get this same shell filter. And this fits my room and my subs and my boxes, and yours will be slightly different. Okay. You would want shell to use... shell yep. filter, it meaning what? So it's a low shelf 12. It means every octave, it's going to bring it up 12 dB. And so my, mine is centered at 20 hertz, and it has a 9 dB gain which is boosting a little bit. So you can just okay. kind of see like if, if it's big enough to see, mm -hmm. you can see that it, like at 30 Hertz, it's going to have, uh, it looks like maybe three or 40 B. Yeah, and by sure. the time you go down an octave, okay. um, it should be and up nine, it should be up 12 DB. Because right. our hearing, we don't perceive low bass frequencies as well as we do higher. Correct. Right. And, and I'm not even trying to do like what they call, um, well, a house curve. Yeah. I'm not even really trying to do that. I'm just trying to balance out the natural roll off of the sealed subs in my room. Right. Because of the placement of the sealed subs, I don't get a lot of boundary gain. <laughs> I have a storage right. room behind the front of my screen. And in mm -hmm. my rear field, my near field subs were basically at like a third point. So my front subs and my rear subs are basically in the one third point of the actual room. Right. And so I don't, I don't get a lot of boundary gain. Now, if I got less boundary, if I got more boundary gain, I'd lower this boost. Okay. But I'm just trying to basically make it flat. So okay. there's a lot of different theories there, a lot of different subjective preferences. Some people like to really boost hard the low end. Like maybe they like the 15 hertz feel a ton. I mm -hmm. just want a nice flat frequency response, and, and I can pull it up. But I'm flat down to 7 hertz, and I just elevate the entire thing. That's my preference. So, so Jonathan, was this something that you were just doing by ear like you would listen to something and then come in here and tweak, or was it no, more not at all? So looking at frequency response exactly i have an omni mic and i was measuring with the omni mic and just trying to make it first i arranged the placement to get the flattest frequency response with no eq which we've talked about in previous thing that ended up being a curve in the front of my room right that made me get the flattest frequency response without doing any peq and i tried everything i tried grouping them in fours i tried stacking them i tried front and back of the room i tried all kinds of things and we're ended up being this kind of that weird orientation that you've seen in the front of my room where it's that curve yeah and that <clears throat> gives a little bit of a distance difference between each sub. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't play with the, it doesn't make all the subs have the same room modes and nulls. It gives right. a little bit of different response for each sub, which balances out to be a very flat response for the whole thing when you consider that there's five of them up there. So that's just through trial and error. And then once I got that trial and error, now, I, now because sealed subs roll off at an 18 dB per octave, I just want to boost that at about 30 hertz or 35 hertz or depend on your box size and your sub itself, the sub parameters, 18 dB per octave. I just wanted to boost that bottom end back up so that I had a nice flat frequency response. So that's, <laughs> that's all I'm doing here. Okay. And then dynamic EQ, I just have a, a slight edge of that applied to all eight channels. So it's only a 3 dB gain. It's another low pass 12. It just means that the lowest volumes, I'm getting mm. a 3 dB more bass. Just a little bump. Okay. Just a little bit extra. Because low volumes, you know, the bass kind of some, seems a little low sometimes. So I don't use dynamic EQ with Odyssey. This has mm -hmm. kind of given me a little bit of that flavor. Okay. And I haven't, this has been like this for probably like close to eight years. And I haven't, mm -hmm. I haven't found the need to mess with it. It's been a very flat frequency response at my main seat. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, it's like set and forget. It's just been there and it's been great. Okay. Um, if, Can... I, if I move stuff, I will play with this. Like this isn't, that's for my old positions. In my new seating setup, I will have to play with this a little bit to get it dialed in perfectly. Okay. And so one thing I, I love about you is that, I mean, I'm kind of a set it, forget it kind of guy, but you take your time. And Ryan, I know you do the same thing. I mean, you guys will go in and go in and tweak and measure and try this. Nope, that didn't work. Let's go back to this other one. I probably would be more apt to do that if I wasn't continually ripping apart my Excuses. home theater, plugging in somebody else's gear, reviewing it, taking it back out, putting mine back in there and going, 
did I change any of my settings for the right. review? <laughs> you know, and those right. types of things. So curious on my end. So the iNuke Remote Connect is that software that comes with your uh, the amplifiers that you're using to drive your subwoofers. That's right. I have. The newer version are called NX6000. These are okay. iNUC DSP6000. They're the older variant. Mm -hmm. And uh, this software is common between them. It'll, it'll have a slightly different color, a slightly different okay. interface, but it's the exact same controls with the NX6000s. And, and then if, therefore, I, because I have this EQ'd in my amplifier, mm -hmm. no matter if I swap out my processor or right. change to an That's AVR or want to play with something, it's all set for my subs. I don't have to do anything. Right. Now, the AVR will calculate distance. So I will run auto EQ if I if I brought in a, a test AVR, mm -hmm. I would run auto EQ to set the distance, then I would just turn it off again. Yeah. So that that would allow me to have my front bank of subs and my rear bank of subs to be time aligned with right. the you know the auto EQ. Mm -hmm. Now and then, then, oh go ahead. Okay, so that's subwoofer one mm -hmm. that we just talked about. Subwoofer two output goes to mini DSP and it has nothing turned on. Well, We'll talk through the configs here in a second, okay. but it has it has no no filters. Everything's bypassed on it, so it's just giving it a straight feed. Now, this is an interesting part that I might lose some of your audience, but I'll try to make sense of it. Go ahead, man. Okay, so butt kickers need preliminary time to fire so that they will hit in time with the subs. They fire slower okay. than a subwoofer driver because it's a big magnetic piston and it's yep. just it's a, it's slower. We okay. actually oh, had I, a big conversation about this on Discord, and there was a lot of misunderstanding, I think, about this recently. So kind of we're trying to time align those, right? So that in a way, so that the effect is happening for both near field and your butt kickers. Yeah. So we kind of okay. talked about this, you and I, when you're in your visit here. If you don't have the subwoofer and the tactile feedback things time aligned, mm -hmm. you're going to hit, like if you get a bass drum hit, you're going to feel two kicks, like yeah. a hit from the sub and then a hit from the transducer. And that's right. awful. You don't That'll want take that. you out of the experience. Right. And so if I didn't have a mini DSP, I would not, to my preferences, to my standards, I would not be able to timeline those butt kickers because they need extra time. They need, mm. they need like a lead, a head start. Okay. So it's what I had substantial. to do, it's not inconsequential time. It's substantial. So what I had to do here, and this is in milliseconds, and this is going to be different for every room. You cannot copy my settings and expect it to work, but you can kind of use this idea to set your ball in motion as far as okay. doing this for your own theater. Right. So this is trial and error. I started mm -hmm. with like 20 milliseconds. I went down to 10 milliseconds. I went down to five milliseconds. And each time I'm running Odyssey and okay. I'm trying to figure out, can I get these things? Can I get this butt kicker dialed in? This is by adding time here, I'm delaying the near field. All right. So when I put 20 seconds in here and then I ran Odyssey and near field was connected to subwoofer two, Odyssey is saying, hey, your near field are like 16 feet away. No, they're not. They're mm -hmm. like, you know, four feet, as according to what it would calculate if I didn't have this mini DSP delay in there. But with the mini DSP, the DSP delay in there, it's telling me they're much further away. And so the, the receiver is trying to send the signal faster. I don't want to get too deep in that. I think I'm going to lose you yeah, or that's lose okay. your audience. But I'm tracking with you. But what it amounts to is I tried those different settings and, mm -hmm. and 10 worked because I could put this up to like three milliseconds okay. and five didn't work because I would have to go negative and you can't go negative delay. Okay, right. So dialing this in perfectly, running Odyssey multiple iterations, I found that seven milliseconds is what I needed. And then I had a little bit of delay that I could add to the butt kickers to get it right. So I had between zero and 0.29 milliseconds to play with as kind of a grace period. Mm -hmm. Any, this makes, if I lower this, it makes the butt kickers fire too fast. Mm -hmm. Like if I lower that, if I raise it, it makes it fire too slow. And okay. this is and this is perceivable down to a hundredth of a millisecond, which we talked about in one of your other videos. Doesn't seem reasonable, but it is. If you want to really fine tune this, it wow. is. And you're so, doing this all by by hear and feel, right? Yeah, the the tactile transducers are all by feel. Yeah. So you, we'll talk about it a little bit more here, but but basically. All I'm doing with the near field is I'm adding a seven millisecond delay and I'm dropping the DB by a couple because I have different configs here. We'll talk about the configs in a minute. Mm -hmm. The boss is my direct attached 12 inch subwoofer. So those are the ones that are just open air. They don't make mm -hmm. any sound. The driver just flaps around and you feel that on your seat. Mm -hmm. um, I figured out just by feel, I need 6.48. So this is 
listen to something with a strong kick drum. Maybe I'm playing some Michael Jackson or something that has a nice kick drum and I'm, mm-hmm. and I'm using my keyboard and I'm just holding it up and down mm-hmm. and I'm, and I'm it's finding kind of the spot where it feels beat. And you're trying yep. to get it where you're not hearing da 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 da. It's just yep. want to be the same time. Okay. And ironically, what you'll find is the feel will go down when you have it perfectly aligned. So if I, if I jump this up a couple of milliseconds, it's going to feel stronger but it's not going to be exactly time lined. And when you have it perfect, the feel kind of like melds together where you can't even tell the tractor's transducer is there. It just gives right. you more impact. And I think, nice. you know, you've kind of had the experience where you, where they blend so well, you just think it's acoustic yeah. energy. You yeah. don't know that there's a thing on the chair shaking it. That is correct. Okay. So then now after you get that time alignment done, you play the bunch of different tracks and you try to figure out what do I need to do with my crossover? Wow. And and this this is another piece. There's there's layers in here. This takes hours to do. It's it's fun months, to do, but it takes time. Hours, months. So and and if you move your chairs at all, or if you switch your chairs out, you have to do it all again. This is for my chairs with my near field with my tactile transducers. It won't work in your room. Like this is this is just how it is. It's just what I'll have to do. I have to set it all up again. So with my boss, I don't. Because they're open air subwoofers and they can bottom out easy, I have mm-hmm. just a high pass filter on it. Mm-hmm. It's at 12 hertz and I'm rolling off 24 dB per octave. Yeah. And then I figured mm-hmm. out that I don't like the direct attached subwoofers playing high because it makes like this feeling like your teeth are buzzing. Like okay. it makes the chair shake too much if you're trying to play. Like say I'm trying to play uh, 80, 80 to 120 hertz subwoofer output mm-hmm. with that with that direct attached boss just the direct attached driver it it makes like a a buzzing that i i can't i don't like so on that point i put a low pass um filter on it and that's at 27 hertz is the cutoff frequency and it's a okay. butterworth and it's 12 db per octave this is all by feel So you come in here and you play with these different filters. You see what you like for a feel. You play with the frequency settings. And you, like, I might listen to a song and I might say, hey, I like on this song, I like 29. And on this other song, I liked 14. And then overall, you know, you kind of come to an overall consensus. It was 27 for me. And this is, this is, like I said, this is with hours of playing and tinkering. And that's where you, that's how you land it. a, a, A setting that's most agreeable for the content you listen to. Nice. Okay. So then butt kickers. We'll just look at this real quick. Um, again, we talked about the delay. I needed about seven milliseconds. I needed those to fire about seven milliseconds faster for it to work. Here's okay. my crossover settings. I don't need a high pass filter on them. They play all the way down to, you know, DC without any problem. Right. Um, at least with the power I'm driving them, I, I don't have them bottom mm-hmm. out. But the same thing applies. I don't like the high frequencies to the butt kicker. It's not a buzzing feeling, but it's like a artificial feeling okay so the they all these transducers are going to feel a little different the boss feels like it's buzzing my teeth together the buck kicker feels like there's something artificial or mechanical about it so i put a high pass filter on it mm-hmm. and again this is a uh, 48 hertz so this is all by feel just playing different content i like listening to mostly music to to lay this out and then just playing with the different uh roll offs to see what you actually end up enjoying right last i have this 40 wind controller which is um it's a light organ effectively like if you think about a christmas light machine you feed an rca subwoofer signal into it and it has uh it's meant for a full range signal and it has a low medium high so you could make christmas lights dance dance to music like mm. one light string would dance to the bass one light string okay. would dance to the mid and the other would dance the high well i'm just using the bass for it it activates a uh fan it, that's a basically like a squirrel cage fan so it's got a really high speed spin up and then i just have that thing set to basically roll off a lot of the frequencies that are higher not quite as strong but it, basically i just didn't want that firing all the time if there's not bass coming through it so mm-hmm. i wanted to activate with explosions i wanted to activate with rumble okay. and i it's it's kind of gimmicky but it's still kind of fun so <laughs> you know i can i can mute any of this stuff at any time too if right. i don't want it yeah, and, and I have that one on my Alexa, so I can say Alexa, turn on the forty wind, or Alexa, okay. turn on the forty wind. Nice. Um, so, so then we have that. That describes the, basically the premise of how this worked, mm-hmm. and I don't have any delay on that because I just want it to fire. It doesn't even matter. It's not. It's just right. not that. It's not that. Uh, temp or whatever. It's not. It's just not. It doesn't matter. Sure. So then I have config two and config three and config four, mm-hmm. and this is no more than just bumping these levels by a couple dB each. Okay. 
So you you saw that when you were over here too. I have a little Correct. mini DSP remote that costs like an extra seven fifty when you buy the mini DSP. Yep. I can hit config two and it jumps the it jumps the levels. Nice. Um, yep. And then config three and it jumps the levels. And I get config four and it jumps the levels. So, so your delays are staying the same. All we're doing is increasing output. Absolutely. Absolutely. Point. Everything stays the same except for my output, just so mm -hmm. I can have like, yeah. hey, I f this person says I want a little fill a little bit more of that. Yeah. You know, I can do that. Now you could also set this up easily enough. Yeah, you could you could set that up easily enough to say, like config one is just gonna be my butt kicker, mm -hmm. config two is just gonna be my boss. Like if mm -hmm. you wanted to, you know, showcase what they did individually, yeah. sure. and then just mute the channels that you wanted. Mm -hmm. So I hope that is a decent overview. Is yeah, there any questions you guys have on yeah. that before I stop sharing? So the big thing, I mean, this is not something that you're going to just plug and play. I mean, this is going to take you hours to learn, maybe days, weeks. Um, but I can tell you just from experience, Jonathan's setup is super, super incredible. And I can tell that he's put in the time, he's put in the hours, he's put in the, the energy needed to learn the software, to learn what tools. But hopefully this at least gets you started as far as what it would take to maybe implement something like that in your setup. So definitely. See, I baseler says a 40 win. Hmm. Already got his wheels turning. Cool, man. Ryan, anything to add to that? I'm, I'm I kind of sure cheated in a way of when I was dialing things in, I found if I pushed and didn't have a curtain on the any of my boss or mm -hmm. butt kickers and i pushed a high enough volume to them yeah. i could hear them audibly and i could use my cell phone to pull them up and track them and record them in slow motion using a um, playback from um spears and munsell for the audio calibration yeah. or lip sync calibration and i was able to dial in that way and it put them all spot on immediately but maybe i cheated um, we'll have to, I'd, I'd be interested, Jonathan, in going through, I just got a sync one too, which is a piece of gear that's dedicated to audio calibration or to lip sync calibration. I'd be interested to see if we could put the boss on it and put the volume up high enough where we could hear it and then see if we could, what the, what the sync one, two thought about it. Mm -hmm. Not obviously but hardware isn't always right. Mm -hmm. Like I find that as you talked about with room correction software there's times all the time when room correction room correction is wrong especially with near fields it can get things horrifically wrong with distances and your eq or whatever it's in all different kinds of things that it's doing which is why i one of the problems with eq is trying to, or with near fields is trying to get it to not be part of your eq which can be difficult sometimes and sometimes people are stuck in running a splitter out of a sub that has already been EQ'd. So now you're mm -hmm. running a near field that is now EQ'd using the same EQ as a front sub. So sometimes if you don't have like a mini DSP, it can be a little bit difficult to get things to isolate. Um, but no, I, I think that's Jonathan really talked about everything that's important. Cool. Him and I run our <clears throat> tactile stuff a little bit different. I don't overlap anything. Mine fall off into one another so only one's active at any given time mm -hmm. my boss takes the higher end and then the butt kicker takes the lower end okay is what i typically use um but that's the beauty of this space with <clears throat> home theaters that there's tons of different ways to do it and jonathan you talked about this earlier with speakers yep. everybody's going to enjoy things a little bit differently and the cool thing is is you can dial it in to what you enjoy and yeah the thing i want to stress with this is don't try and do things just because somebody else does something try and find something that makes sense to you and what you enjoy instead of trying to convince yourself to enjoy something that maybe somebody else says is correct yeah for sure and i think one thing that we're going to try to do is something different for m wave um again this is only our second year doing this but we want to provide you with experiences that really you're you just can't get anywhere else and so one thing that that Ryan and I have been talking about, and, and he's working on figuring out how best to implement that at M-Wave, is give you the opportunity to experience what are some some differences between, say, a near field subwoofer, a butt kicker, a boss platform, um, and having a tactile experience. So are we still good for that, Ryan? 
I think so. <laughs> <laughs> he called you out again. <laughs> and I throw that out there right? because I've got throw that out there because I know that that again some of the things that we're trying with M Wave hasn't been done before, and so we're literally having to to figure out okay what does that look like? How can we switch between those things? How can we have multiple people experience you know the same thing? Um, and so definitely there's some challenges there, but that's one of the goals for this year is to be able to provide that experience for you um, to be able to see what is it like to have those things and to be able to turn those on and off during a movie clip to see how they enhance it or does it distract you know from the movie or um, does it add something that maybe you're missing in your home theater and just give you another perspective. Um, you know, a lot of these people, I've seen some comments, they're like uh, near field subwoofers are game changers. Where was that comment at? I would agree with that. Here we go, Fred. Fred says near field subwoofers are game changer. I remember the first time I had experienced near field, I was like, "Holy cow!" Like this is straight up cool because, you know, in my setup, in order to really feel it, what do I have to do? I've got to crank up the volume pretty stinking loud. Versus Jonathan can have his just go in kind of at a moderate volume. People can be in the back, kind of having a conversation. And the people that are sitting there on in the seats, man, they're feeling that. It's just a nice thump. It's not overwhelming. It's not distracting. But it definitely adds a level of realism. Um, and just some – I love subwoofers, man. I, I get excited um, when I feel that explosion, you know, when I feel the rumble, when I feel uh, in Jurassic Park, you know, the big dinosaur puts his foot down or in ready player one Kong jumps onto the freeway. When that thing happens, like in my brain, I'm like, okay, we should feel that. That should be like an earthquake kind of thing. And some setups you hear that, but you don't feel it. And I think that's what tactile transducers and um, near field subwoofers bring to the table. Um, yeah. So I'm mean, appreciate that JD. So yeah, so that's, it's one of those things that we're trying we want to go where no one has gone before and uh, we're willing to, to try it out. And the cool thing is every year we'll continue to learn and get better and figure out what works, what doesn't work and how we can improve that. And uh, so we're super, super excited about M wave 2023. So very cool, man. Any other thoughts on that? Mm. All right. I might, I might have one more thing that I think yeah, I, I touched on, but I don't think I elaborated into. So I said that I kind of didn't like any EQ on my near field, and, I, and I, ex, I sort of explained why, but I think the point being is that if your EQ tries mm -hmm. to, yeah. if your auto EQ tries to tune those things for a flat response where the mic is, like directly above them, yeah. it's, going to, it's going to really accent some frequencies to get there and pull some frequencies down. Mm -hmm. And you want your near field subs to have a smooth frequency response. Think about the frequency response. If it's a flat frequency response, it's like a piano where all the notes have the same exact volume. And if you have the dramatic EQ applied that the auto EQ will try to do if your mic is directly above and it's off, it's not in front of it, it's just off, mm -hmm. you're going to have like this note's going to be three times louder than this note, and this note's going to be twice as quiet as this note. And if you're listening to like music or you're listening to something that has like a sine sweep or something, it's not going to sound even as that bass moves through the range. You're going right. to feel like a lot more frequency at a certain pitch, or or you know, it's just it's it's not going to feel right. And so that's what I that's the part that I kind of missed in my explanation. I wanted to elaborate a little bit on that. Sure. Now. There's another element to this, and I haven't really gone to this level. I didn't think I needed to in my last chairs, but I've read and heard Sheldon does it. Certain frequencies on certain chairs activate more than others, right? The chair has yeah. kind of resonant frequencies yeah. itself, too, in some cases, depending on how you mount them or what you're using. Right. So there's these apps called like Vibe Sensor and so forth on your phone. And you can, and it'll give you a reading, like how much, like objectively, how much measurement or how much vibration are you getting at this mm -hmm. frequency? And you can climb the darn charts, the frequency yeah. response charts, and you can measure every frequency, maybe every five hertz or something. And you can tune your tactile transducer to make it a nice, flat, objectively flat frequency response and tactile shake at the same time. Right. That's a whole nother level. It's no harder than what we've been doing. I didn't feel the need for it, but that's another thing to explore. Right. 
I think another thing that's important too is that your chair is going to have an impact. Like if you were to try and EQ this using a measurement mic on the other side of the chair, your chair is going to have an impact on what that mic is measuring. And mm -hmm. if you're trying to EQ based on what you're measuring, that's not necessarily what you're going to feel when the near field is firing, especially if you're using audio EQ, because the e audio EQ is going to try and blend that sub in with the other subs. And it's just not going to be an overall solid experience. I'm of the opinion, and this is another part where I differentiate from Jonathan. I don't have that shelf on my yeah. subs. I just let them go for my near fields. Um, there's nothing wrong with what Jonathan's doing. I think it's just it's something we do differently. Yep, yeah. Sure. Personal preference. Sure there is. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Obviously, there's a right way to do it, and Jonathan's wrong. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, man. Before we jump into the questions, just the general questions, we do have a couple super chats that came in, so let me go ahead and address those. Um, I cope, appreciate the $10 super chat. Building a dedicated 7.2.4 room with the MRX 1140, uh, pushing three power sound audio MTM 210Ms as the LCR behind an acoustic transparent screen. Need recommendations on side and back surrounds plus Atmos, but all need to be in. Well, okay, so here's where it gets challenging. Budget is 15 to 2,000 all in. Um, room is 12 by 22. So basically, we've got power sound audio for the LCR, but you can't go with traditional bookshelves or side surrounds. So we're looking at really some um, in wall, but the budget is. Two thousand dollars total. Oh, that's a lot of speakers. Yeah. Um, give me some clarification, Icope. If you're still in the chat, you don't have to throw another super chat. Just put the put some that's additional speakers for that. Yeah, I mean, if that's two that's grand high. for all of that, that's going to be a lot. If you're saying two fifteen to two thousand each, and that's a huge budget, then that's easy. Yeah. Um, if you're talking super, super, super budget. Um, I would probably recommend looking at mono price in walls. That's the only thing I can even think of that would remotely, and I don't even know if you'd be able to get in that uh, mono price in walls. Let's see what they run. So they're running. Okay. So you definitely, um, yeah. So some of those are like 350 bucks. I see some more for two hundred dollars a piece. So yes, yeah. so you could you could get by with that. Can you guys think of any other? Oh, here we go, youth man. I'm not an audiophile, just looking for something dynamically close. I got you. So the hard thing is getting something dynamically to sound the same as, you know, the MTM two tens. Um, yeah, it's it's gonna be a trick because okay. those are yeah. compression MTM two tens are compression driver based. They're gonna be yeah. like high efficiency machines. Yeah. And a lot of and your in wall stuff is not that. See, that's the thing. I don't think the mono price are gonna be super, super efficient. I know Aaron mm -hmm. from Aaron's Audio Corner, he reviewed um and he's we're actually gonna have him on the channel pretty soon. They and he's gonna be joining us for M Wave as well. He measured those. He said they measured really well, but I don't think I don't think you can drive them like really hard because of their efficiency. So, yeah, I think that's where your challenge is going to be. Um, you know, if your says, budget, do we think that? the room is too small? Should I go to five two four? That's a twenty two feet is in a short room. No, it's a it's little, little bit bigger. Room. Mine's thirteen by nineteen. But given uh, that budget, yeah, I mean, I've got seven point two point four. I don't, I don't think your room is too small for that. No. But the budget um, makes it tough. Yeah, I think that's going to be hard. But like I said, if you're looking for super budget, at least use, check out what model market. But all right, so what brands could he look at? Like Triad makes in walls. I know they've got three tiers, so you'd probably well, in walls get... are going to be hard for the used market. True. On wall, yeah, true. Um, Bookshelves on your wall? Do they have to be in the wall? That's a really hard one. Yeah, I mean, your in budget's always... really going to be more of like your installer level mm -hmm. speakers from most manufacturers, like yeah. Martin Logan, Focal, um, yeah. Triad. I don't even, yeah, they've got some installer level stuff at that price point, but they're not going to be able to keep up with the PSAs. Yeah, true. It's going to be tough. Yeah, I mean, man, I think you got a great front sound stage though, you know, and then the Anthem MRX eleven forty. Important part. That's awesome. Here, I'm going to get. I want to go give him some ideas here. Yeah, go ahead, man. 
present, share screen, share screen. We'll hide this just to give us more real estate. So this is a website called slickdeals.net. You probably heard of it. If not, it's just a deal forum. Good website. People, yeah, people just post deals they find and the Dangerous community rates them up. Website. Yeah. <laughs> so I just typed in wall speaker. Mm -hmm. And here's there the kind of stuff that you find, right? In the ads. And then these are the community deals that have been posted. And some of these things are going to be long expired, but you can make an alert in here mm -hmm. and you could just set up. And if you're not terribly picky, there's mm -hmm. deals to be had, right? So here's, if you got some time on your hand too. Yep. Like build here's, it over time. Another suggestion I say, I think is for sort by relevance or sort by instead of relevance, just sort by newest so that you mm -hmm. can get a lot of the speakers and stuff that are still. Right. With deals active instead of a lot of the things that are expired. Right. So there's an in-wall subwoofer. But there, I, this was not that old, and it might still be valid. This oh. this right here is the Monoprice THX, yeah. LCR THX certified. It's got THX twice in there. In-wall mm -hmm. speaker. Um, 177. I don't know how good of a deal that is off normal price. But... Um, Looks like they got two different sizes. They got the 365 for 177, 265 for 151. Something like that is what we were talking about mm -hmm. previous. You know, like that's probably a good value and might be something to consider. They got clips in here. Just just they something like that. Walls, yeah. My recommendation at this point, given what you have for your fronts, you've got a great processor. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you can, stick with your LCR for a while and save. Because I mm -hmm. think you're just going to... You're limiting yourself by yeah. trying to buy something and then putting it in with those PSAs. Yeah, There's just so much of a disparity between anything that you're going to be able to get at that price point, new, in comparison to what those PSAs are going to be able to deliver. Yeah, and I think we've all been there. You know, it's, it's one of those things we want the system now. And I've always tried to encourage you, enjoy the journey, build it. Don't be scared to build it over time. Very few of us... Um, in this hobby, have the luxury of just writing a check, buying all of the equipment, unless you're Brian in the chat. Um, <laughs> Brian still hasn't built his theater. <laughs> I love Brian, man. He's awesome. Um, but I think every, but, all four of us here have yeah. been on that journey and continue to be on that journey. 100%, yeah, man. I mean, so think I, about it. I, I had, think it's really important that people don't compare no, to other people's systems no. because it's you're just seeing what they have now and yeah. not the progression that has occurred yeah. for a lot of those people's enthusiast lifespans. Yeah. So it's kind of, I kind of equate it to, it's almost like the, the child that grew up in a home that was a nice home, you know, a pretty, not substantial, but just a, a really nice home. And you leave the house at 18 and you get your first full-time job, maybe, or second, or you start, you start your career and you're like, man, I want that kind of house. Problem is you don't make that kind of income. You don't, you haven't spent 40 years of your life to get to that point. It's almost like Michael is talking about his kids. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so my son, he bought a, he didn't buy. I mean, this is our first home that we've ever purchased. All the rest of them we've rented. Um, and so here we are, we've been married now for 26 years. And so for the first 12 years or so, we, we rented. And so it took us a long time before we even bought a home. And then we bought kind of not really our dream home, but it's a nice home. And, but my kids just starting off, they're not buying something like this. You know, they're buying a, um, you know, Jacob and Alanis, they bought a, a town home, which is pretty much like a, an apartment, but they own it. They actually purchased it. They make a mortgage on it and everything, but, but I think that's the same thing. And Ryan is totally correct. I think looking at somebody else's setup and say, <laughs> Ryan, Ryan's like, hey, now I'm just messing with you, brother. Um, but it's one of those things where, like Brett says, it's stepping stones. You know, you got to take those baby steps. But I think Ryan gives good, solid advice. And I, I know he did mention, hey, I'm not an audiophile. I don't need something amazing. Um, I just want sound maybe just that, be careful of that well that you may know, be true once you experience what those psas can do and you put something next to them you're gonna notice yeah so it yeah. might be one of those things to where try to build it over time like maybe don't worry about atmos right now just worry about getting a nice bed layer because i rocked a 5.1 for a long time then i went to 7.1 for a while 
And then it wasn't for many years. I always thought Atmos was kind of gimmicky. I'm thinking, man, that's that's just another way for these receivers and AVR companies to sell me on their product and get me to upgrade my receiver. I ain't going down that path. And then I heard one. I'm like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> And then but I heard there some, are significant yeah. diminishing returns. Yes. Once you pass yeah, 5.1, yeah. there is di significant diminishing det returns the yeah. further down you go through this. Yeah. So it was one of those things where don't be scared to build this thing over time. But I know, and I bet I can, and Jordan, pipe in at any time during this conversation because I want to get different perspectives. But I know the times that I have made those, what I call cutting corners to save mm -hmm. uh, finance, you know, um, when I wasn't willing to save up a little bit more to sacrifice a little bit more time, I always I think regretted you, you that. You misnamed those. Those are actually spending more in the long run. <laughs> yes. what those are typically. It is, it is because you, um, okay. So I'm, I'm looking at his question again. So he says, uh, let me actually pull it up here. And while you're pulling but, it up, I'll chime in. I mean, yeah, kind of going back to the analogy, like I'm 38. I lived with my parents till I was 33, 34. I mm -hmm. got my first house, just wasn't able to do it before. Yeah. And with with the speakers, like I had the same speakers for 10 years, mm -hmm. the same speakers. And I was in the same. I, I'm not going to lie. I'm an impulse buyer. Mm -hmm. And that's gotten me in trouble a few times. But, you know, saving up for the speakers that you want. Yeah. Even like right now, I still have a mix match. Like I've been upgrading my speakers to Arundel, and I love them. Okay. And I have all my bed layer, well, except for the in walls. But I have mm -hmm. some in ceilings and in walls. And right now, I don't really have another. Op they don't make any in walls. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, my system still sounds good, and I like it. But I still yeah. want to improve it. But I would same like Ryan was saying. Like I would rather, and I would encourage you to save up for, you know, just get everything that's timber matched. And, you know, maybe you might have to just go with being only 5.1 or whatever, you know, forgo the, the insulin, but save up because if you buy something and then you realize you don't like it, now you've got to try to fight, try to sell those speakers and you're right. going to lose mm -hmm. money. So yeah. it just makes more sense to just, you know, save up. It takes time and it's frustrating. I've sure. been there, but yeah. Do they have to be in walls? That's what, see, that's what I'm, I was wanting to go back to that because part of the problem is he has... LCRs from Power Sound Audio, but they don't make an in wall. They I think make, the problem is his room width, right? Didn't he say it was twelve foot wide? It's twelve foot wide rooms. Come I mean, off the walls. Fairly small. I mean, yeah. I mean, mine, mine's thirteen, so it's not. But if much. He's only doing two seats. Like if he did, I don't know how many seats, but if he did yeah. two seats, you still have a significant amount of room all the way around. Sure. Yeah, three's going to get tight. And the, the reason I bring up, do they have to be in walls? Is because if you do on walls, <laughs> on walls. meaning like yeah. bookshelves or like what Jonathan has sitting behind him, the 70 J ones or any of that stuff. Or even like the, I mean, it opens better. up the used market and there mm -hmm. are tremendous deals to be had in the used market. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, could he go something with like the, let's just say for instance, the, well, I think his budget's going to be blown though. Is I was it, thinking is, the height speakers from um, so SBS. Somebody asked in the chat about what was it, SC8s from JBL. Those mm. are really popular surround speaker, and you can pick those up for three or four hundred bucks. SCH, each, JBL, S yeah. And that, that was one thing he was asking. It's like, okay, what what would you recommend? Are you talking Once about the you start getting into like the four or five hundred dollar range? It opens up a lot of doors, and you can get them used for cheaper than that, right? Mm -hmm. So you can absolutely. And they're a very they're a very popular widespread speaker. I mean, they've been around a long time. They're not what going anywhere. They'll be around. SCS eight. I had a I was missing a character. SCS eight. Sheldon had those for a while. Uh, for the so so they're great. Uh, a lot of people use of, those for tops. Yeah, you've heard of Please. Michael and Ryan for sure. Yep. So hopefully that all speakers. Yeah. So hopefully that'll help you out. I mean, I know we're. Part of it is budget, but part of it, we just don't want you to make a jump and get all these in walls and then go, hmm, it's just not a good match. They're not going to keep up. I personally you know? think you're going to get an over, for the most part, there are some standouts, mm -hmm. but you're also going to get an overall better experience using a traditional cool. cabinet speaker than you will okay. an in wall, gotcha. in my opinion. Okay. So they're not terribly cheap. You can mount them with the bracket in the back or the top right. or whatever. You can use these for every position. You can find them okay. used, probably half price. 
Right. And they're and these are going to be high output speakers. Mm -hmm. So they're yep. going to be able to keep pace with your with your high efficiency mains, your fronts. Yeah. They're going to have a similar a similar style. These are kind of like uh sort of a baby version of what uh, Michael's running now with his JTR coaxials. Yeah. These are coaxials as well. Yep. Okay. And they're going to blend like deep pretty well with the PSAs. I like that. Cool, yeah, man. And another thing is that, you know, if you if you go with in walls, once you cut that hole in your wall, like the yeah. chances of you finding another speaker that's going to <laughs> fit exactly, it's probably not going to happen. So if I could do it all over again, I wouldn't put any in walls. I did that because I don't have room on the sides yeah. to sure. have even mount to speaker because my room is only 10 feet wide. Like it's exactly 10 feet wide. So I really only have the option. And when right. I moved in here, I just got some cheap poke speakers to put mm -hmm. you know in walls so yeah so the hard thing with in walls most of them aren't amazing to be honest with mm -hmm. you you're going to sacrifice a lot of sound quality for that because it's convenient it it disappears in the room wife um, approval factor though they do shine very well yeah it's, it's amazing and that's what i was going to um, ask if that was his situation as well or was it just the space it yeah. looks like from his previous comment that he just hadn't researched it very much yeah. He said he could go with on walls. One of the other shortcomings that you run into with on walls is you can't direct them. In walls? Becomes, on walls? Sorry, in walls. You can't yeah. direct them. And that becomes an issue because if you look at, like, if I take you down to my room or in Michael's room, and Jordan, mm -hmm. I haven't seen your room, or Jonathan's room, yeah. everything is angled towards the main listening positions. Yeah. Uh, and within walls, you would have to build the enclosure <laughs> or the wall in order to make that happen. Love it. So pay off the spouse. There you go. <laughs> the in walls are just really for aesthetics. There yeah. are some phenomenal in walls. Most of them are going to be phenomenally expensive. Yeah. Um, they have dedicated backer boxes and they're uh, they almost exactly like an on wall. They're just sitting in a wall <laughs> but you're still restricted on direction, upgradability. There's mm -hmm. a bunch of compromises that you're having to make when you do that. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Great question, man. Definitely appreciate the super chat. So Jason says, which way do you guys prefer and why? So HDMI cables into the receiver and then out to the TV or run the HDMI cables to the TV and then out to the receiver with eARC TV switch faster. But what about the audio? Great question, Jason. I actually just had somebody, I made a video today and it was just a real basic walkthrough of how do you set up a home theater in a living room environment? And one of those things that I mentioned in there was using eARC. And one of the questions I got was, and it might have even been yours, is do you go, like I've always gone straight into the AVR, out of the AVR to the TV and just using the ARC that way or eARC. Um, but do you guys go straight into your display? Both of you guys are using projectors on the right. Um, Jordan, do you use a projector or TV in your setup? I use a projector. Okay, so, so all four of us have projectors. Yeah. But we have um, TVs. Yeah. So what would you recommend on that? <laughs> I mean, we're not, we're not heathens here. <laughs> but not everybody is running a full surround sound system, I guess is my thought, but I guess maybe that's not necessarily the case. So it could even be just two speakers in that, but would you run the HDMI cable from your sources to the TV and then eARC back? Or do you go into the hub, the AVR or processor and then eARC out? Does it matter? It matters if you have. Does eARC have a limitation on speakers, Ryan? It has the potential to add a little bit of delay, potential. Yes. But I don't know if it has a limitation on speakers. That would be the other. Um, I mean, it can do. I mean, eARC can, can do up handle... to like forty-eight, can it? eARC with the two <sighs> HDMI two point one. I know I HDMI two point is limited, very limited. That has a, that has a specific with channel just channel. arc, right? Yeah. But okay, I, so the, the scope for eARC to deliver up to 32 channels of 32. audio. Okay. Yeah, so right. there's no it's restriction fine. there. No, yeah, but you're good. Here's, I prefer running everything into my AVR processor because mm -hmm. the AVR or pre-pro is designed to do exactly what you're trying to get it to do. Mm -hmm. The TV, what do you do? I mean, I wouldn't do that. The only time I can see somebody needing to do this is like in my son's case. So he has a 3.0 system in his home. So he just has a left, a center and a right. 
he does game a lot, but his AVR is not HDMI 2.1. It doesn't support 4K yes. 120. Yep. So in that case, he takes his PS3, or I'm sorry, PS3, PS5, goes directly into the TV because the TV supports 4K 120. He takes the Xbox, goes straight into the TV. So now he has to switch inputs on the TV depending on what gaming console he's playing. And then he comes out of that back to his AVR, and then out to the speaker. So I can see the benefit there, but if you have a receiver or an AVR or a processor that can support the format that you need. So in my case, I don't necessarily need 4K 120 because my projector doesn't support 4K 120. Um, but everything I go in, I'm like Ryan, I go into my AVR and then out through that. I don't use ARC in my theater room because there's no smart, um, apps, I guess, inside the projector to need to send audio from the projector back. But in the living room, I do. So I stream Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus from the TV, come into uh, the SVS Soundbase Pro, and then out to my speakers. So, um, Jonathan, what would you do? So I think I'm always a little bit sensitive to the potential for lag with, uh, okay. with if you're using like an Xbox series x and e arc i've heard i've heard and read on the forums that some people say if you're using dolby atmos it can create a little lag okay. i i like having my on-screen gui from my denon and Marantz processors so you would lose that if you did e arc mm -hmm. um i i do what you suggested as well michael i feed everything into the avr and the avr has one hdmi cord to my projector okay jordan yeah so normally i would go straight into the avr you know from my projector to the receiver i'm doing something a little bit different because i have an hd fury which allows okay. me to have dolby vision so i'm going from the projector into the receiver for my video and then all my sources are going into the hd fury but the hd fury is plugged into one of the hdmi sources so the hd okay. fury does the switching but in a normal situation same mm -hmm. i would just go straight into it the only time mm -hmm. i would do that scenario what he's talking about is what your son has to do so mm -hmm. I'm planning on mm -hmm. upgrading my projector to the Epson LS12000B, and that's going to mm -hmm. have HDMI 2.1, but my receiver's not. So I'm going to have to run an extra cable just to get the audio because I want the, you know, the 48 gigabits per second or whatever the HDMI 2.1 is. Right. Sure. Super cool, man. Appreciate the question. Joey, thanks so much for the $5 super chat. Um, he says, nice meeting you last week, Jordan. Thanks for doing the... The Wendell Diller Magnapan video. Watch through the rough cut. Nice work, man. And thank you, bro. Yeah. Nice to meet you as well. So I met him. I was going to go film uh, Wendell's. So he had some Martin Logans in there that he took the bass drivers out to mm -hmm. show that you could use their, I think it's their new dipole, dipole woofer that they're using. Okay. That basically, you can hook them up to any speaker. And he was going to be filming in there and i had my camera gear and he was like i was like well i'll shoot the video and i'll just you know give you a copy of it so right but yeah nice guy it's always good and that's one of the benefits of going to you know av shows is the connections that you're going to make you know the friendships that you'll establish the people that you connect with and uh we're actually going to have several content created i think there's six or i think as of now we've got six maybe seven that are going to be there seven at M wave. So super and, excited about that. And on that, I had a question for Ryan. Did you see that room, Ryan? Which room? So it was, it was the window. Yeah. It was a magnum hand room that he had. He actually didn't have his magnum pans in there. He was using the, uh, I don't remember what, which Martin Logan's it was, but it was electrostatic that he had taken the base driver out and was using the, their new technology of the dipole woofer or whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. I was curious I to see what you would think about that. the magnet room where he had like these stands for them. So there was two <laughs> rooms. Actually, I think I, there might have been three, but there's I think two there rooms. Was, yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah. see this room. I shot two of them. Uh, I didn't get the third one. But yeah, that one, I was curious to see what your thought was on that, the way that he had it set up. But Might have to send me the video if you don't mind. I'd like to see yeah. that. I'll send it to you. That'd be great. Cool. Joy, appreciate the super chat there. Let me go back up here. One more thing on that eARC thing. Yeah. How, how does it manage the lip sync? So the AVRs have an automated lip sync adjustment. Mm -hmm. Does anyone know how that's done if you do the eARC or do you have to manually do it? From what or does I it just, account for it? 
from what I understand, I think it's supposed to, I, I think it's supposed to do it automatically. And I don't know if you can adjust it because mm -hmm. I don't have any experience with it, but I remember when it came out when I was reading on it, it's supposed to improve it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I haven't I had know. any, I haven't noticed any lip sync issues in the, um, in the living room. And so I'm sure I've just got it That's set to, to auto. Yeah. So supposedly it has an automatic lip sync adjustment feature. Yeah. yeah. That's what it says. All the sources I'm saying say either has no delay, mm -hmm. which I think it does to some extent, but it's compensated for automatically by the processing. Yeah. Cool. Z's Gaming Channel says, I wonder, I was wondering if you have your links to your channel. I like watching your home theater rooms. Um, your tours. I think it's talking about you, Michael. Your tours. Okay, so it's on your channel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're I was, here. I was like, yeah, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm a little confused. These on your question. Um, on my channel, you can go to playlists, and then you can find there's home theater, uh, uh, home theater tours playlist. There's like, I don't know, over fifty videos in that playlist of different home theaters. Jonathan's is in there. Ryan's is in there. Um, plus a whole bunch of other ones. There's a million dollar. Star Wars home theater in there. Have you done um, 50 already? What's that? Have you done 50 videos? Already? Dude, I've been doing this for five years. Man, I started I doing that. I've watched all of them, but it just I've started seem doing like home theater tours five years ago. I was probably the wow. first one to ever do a home theater tour that I know of. Um, I think you're the so only I'm, one doing them. No, no, no. There's Still. plenty of people doing them. Mm, He's the only one that matters. not on the scale that you're doing them. I get it. But I mean, there are people that are are covering, which is awesome. They're covering other people's home theaters. Some are having to do them remotely. Because they don't they don't have access to home theaters, um, so but definitely there's some great content creators that are doing that as well. But yeah, so I'm not sure your question there. Let's see, appreciate it though. Eight seven six over Winfrey Ryan, why did you go with the Storm Audio versus the Trenov? Mm, that's a good question. Um, this is subjective, right? So this isn't based in anything with measurements or anything anything like that mm -hmm. i just personally like the way storm with its eq and everything sounds more than turn off fair enough that's really it and i like the ease of use with peq and a bunch of other features that storm brings to the table are you talking about the signature sound or just how it sounded with your speakers no i've never been into a not in, just in my room i've never been into a room that i've really enjoyed with mm -hmm. Trinov. It's not saying that Trinov's bad. Mm -hmm. It's just not my cup of tea. Yeah. That's really it. I All think right. it's a great product, just not for me. So total side note, because we're about to grab a, a different kind of topic. If you like the video, man, you're having fun tonight. I see one little thumb up, at least on my end. This is the first <laughs> time you have ever said this. When we've I've, been never, doing this. I've never asked anybody to no. do this, but but let us know, man. If you don't leave, I'm just kidding. I'm just totally kidding. Just Was he? Totally kidding. Hey, Bodie or Billy, he says, uh, how'd you get started with editing? So that's pretty cool. Mine actually dates back to 2004. Um, we had the short version as it, I was in a church. I was a student pastor and we were, uh, one of my students had the idea of, you know, for Easter, he was want he's into drama and he was wanting to like bust in the back door with Jesus and flog him and like do a reenactment or something. And my pastor was like, I think we're going to like have some heart attacks if that happens. You know, this was, um, that just wouldn't fly. Did you like, do this during a service? Yes. Like oh. pastors preaching. And then all of a sudden back door bus open, Jesus comes in, you know, and they're flogging him. They go through the, He's like, ah, that's not going to fly. Why don't you make a video? And so literally, I didn't know anything. This uh, young gentleman, he had Premiere, old, old, old. I think it was like Premiere 1.0. And he's like, I got the software. I have no idea how to use it. So he wrote the script. I had a video camcorder back then, a Sony Handycam. We filmed it. I had to learn how to video edit. And I'm like, this is actually kind of cool. I like this. It's kind of fun. And so then I got into website development and then this was way pre YouTube, but I began making videos. Like I did a couple weddings for people. And so then I edited those and then I did just some other projects. And then later on down the road, I began to utilize that for my channel. And so I've, I've used premiere pro uh, later on. I switched over to DaVinci resolve cause it was free. 
Um, I was using a bootleg copy a long, long time ago. Uh, oh. Illegitimate copy. <laughs> um, I told God, I said, look, if I ever start making Calling money, because I'm doing this for the church, right? You know, so that's how I was justifying it. I said, I'm not making any money off this. It's just, you know, for the church stuff. But I said, if I ever start making money, like as a business, then I'll buy the software. Sorry, was, officer. I didn't mean to steal it, but I'm not going to steal it. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I did eventually, you know, so for a long time on my channel, when I started five years ago, I, I was using DaVinci Resolve because it's free and it's a great software, but it takes a pretty beefy computer to, to run it. Um, it's not super, super efficient in that regard. And then later on, I'm like, you know what? I use Photoshop every single day. I use Lightroom. I might as well buy the Creative Suite. My wife's a school teacher, so we get a discount there. And um, and so now I have Premiere Pro, which I edit on. So that's kind of where I got started video editing. Jordan, you're the guest. How did you start getting, when did you get into video editing? YouTube. So that's, I would say, that's probably the biggest thing. Once I decided I wanted to start making videos, that mm -hmm. was probably the one thing that helped me back. I knew absolutely nothing mm -hmm about video editing yeah nothing so it was youtube <clears throat> youtube yeah. there's videos for everything so I, yes. I did some of that um i started also on davinci resolve because it was free yeah but i found very quickly that the plex computer that i built myself was not <laughs> up yeah. to up to par for that and so yeah. i bought a macbook and i started using final um, cut final cut mm -hmm. i did the three three month trial okay that ran out so then I went back to DaVinci and I was like, I hate this. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. So I had to go back to, and it, it's funny. I was like, there's gotta be a way. Cause I didn't want to spend the money either, Yeah. but I was like, there's gotta be a way to continue using final cut. And I found a way to like hack the oh. trial. <laughs> there's a lot of bootlegging going on tonight. <laughs> so I used the trial version for about a year. I'm clean, by the way. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I used the trial version for about a year. And then when I started editing for Chris, mm -hmm. I was like, all right, I can't like, I got to use the actual software. So I actually bought it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I didn't know anything about it. And same thing happened to me. I started editing. I was like, man, this is kind of fun. I kind of, yeah. I kind of like this. Yeah. And it's same a creative thing. process. It takes yeah. a long time, but it's a creative process. It's and fun. there's so, there's so many plugins that can help you be a much better editor than I actually, actually am. Cause again, first videos bad, just yeah. horrible. And I'm yeah. still learning, but yeah. Laziness five, a lot of times is a starting point for innovation. Yeah. I'm five years into YouTube and I still don't think my videos are really like, they're not fancy, Same. man. Yeah. Mine are straight up pretty easy. My timeline is basic. You know, I look at build montage man, he puts a lot of animation in there. Um, my friend, um, oh my goodness, Brad, home theater gamer. He's I mean, good. he color grades and, he does a lot, and he actually just switched over, maybe to Final Cut. He um, color he just, grades. He color grades. Bro. Oh I my just, gosh! Dude, I knew some to, of it, but not all. Here's the, time. the thing: Brad went to film school. Brad yeah, takes you every tell, bit. Of, Brad takes every bit of his audio, brings it over into Adobe Audition, hmm. and tweaks his audio before he even brings it back into the project. Oh. So he does so <laughs> much more than I do. I'm like, eh, good enough. <laughs> No, I'm not. I got a wireless that. microphone. We're good, <laughs> you know. So, but yeah, um, and y'all don't probably do much editing, do you, Ryan and Jonathan? I mean, I did. I oh, still Jonathan, do. yeah, you do. Jonathan's got his YouTube channel. Plug for Jonathan, man. There you go. <laughs> like mine's, mine's still like your guys' early stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Mine has nothing to do with home home theater. Yeah, I couldn't even find you on YouTube, Ryan. I kept searching. Yeah, for he's it. not. I am. But not it for home theater at all. He's okay. he's hidden. I'm for professional Twitch streaming with Combat Flight Sim. My yeah, name's he, not he's, anywhere. He's on a different platform. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rhymes with Sony Pans or something like that. I, I need to pick your brain, Michael. I I've used DaVinci Resolve to make about yeah. three videos, but I have trouble getting my iPhone's 4K HDR videos to work properly with like. DaVinci yeah. Resolve. Yeah. It's so, hard. so the last few that I've made for the projector comparisons, I've literally just been editing on my iPhone, which is really mm -hmm. super cheesy. But yeah. that, it works. It, it works. I did that too. That's what I've been doing. Yeah. I actually forgot I started on my iPad doing that. And it was very yeah. cumbersome because I had to try to start. I was using my phone and then I had to like airplay the video to my iPad to edit mm -hmm. it. And then I had to like somehow 
upload that to YouTube. It was very cumbersome, and I was like, I need to get a camera and a mic. Yeah, so that's, it takes a while. That's a lot of work. It is. It was I'm very so lazy that I would. My whole gig doing the Twitch streaming stuff mm -hmm. is I cast in such a way that I do zero editing afterwards. I just upload <laughs> everything and I'm done. Yeah. Nice. Definitely lots of ways to do it. Um, what's Jonathan's YouTube channel? So if you, well, I'll tell you what, um, I'll pull it up real quick. I'll drop it in the chat. John, the hardest part is spelling his name. <laughs> On B-O-N-E-N-G-E-L-N. There we go. We well, used to have it on our pictures here, but get rid it's of that and you there can you go. see it. It should be on there. It is now. Okay, cool. So is Let your channel talk. your name? Uh, yeah. so, yes. Jonathan. All right. Go send him some love. He's got some awesome stuff. He does projector comparisons. He does um, all kinds of home theater stuff. He dives in deeper, way deeper than what I do. So super, super cool. All right. So I just dropped that in the chat. Got another super chat. Speaking of that, Eric. Thank you so much for your love and support, man. $10 Super Chat. Always a pleasure, guys. Thanks. We appreciate you, man. Appreciate you hanging out and asking great questions and just allowing us to, to try to, I don't know, motivate you guys and help you answer questions and uh, bring some laughs in the process. So Ty says, maybe a dumb question, but I'm about to switch my AVR into preamp mode for just the LCRs rears heights using the internal amps do all avrs turn off the internal amp automatically once it gets signal from pre-out that's a great question so i can speak for the marantz and denon the older marantz and denon well pretty much most avr i like to explain it this way the pre-outs are just always hot they're always on so if you plug in a cable to it run it to an amplifier it's going to automatically send that signal but it's not going to disengage the internal amplifiers on the, the AVR itself. I think last year or maybe the year before, Denon and Marantz came out with a series of amplifiers and they have a preamp only mode. And so you would go into the configuration in your setup, what they call amp assign, and you, you change it to preamp mode. Now, when you do that though, it, totally shuts down all internal amplification so all your channels so you can't have some of those channels turned off and the rest turned on because they're all being powered by one power supply that power supply is just distributing the ample or the i guess the power to each channel so it's hard to do that so it's either all or nothing now whether or not there are any other avrs out there that can do that i don't know so i'll let you guys speak to that i I know the newer anthems, so I think it's the like 740s and the uh, 1140s. They have, I don't know what the the maximum amount is, but they allow you to use some of your unused. Like if you're using preamp mode and you have some extra channels from the internal amps, they'll actually let you reassign those and use those. But other than that, um, I don't know of any other ones that can, you know, kind of have like a dual function right being able to use the pre-out you guys aware of anything everything i know doesn't do it except for yeah. Denon and Marantz. I'm, I'm sure there's other things out there but i'm not aware of them and right. and the rank and file stuff from like onkyo and pioneer and yamaha and stuff they mm -hmm. don't they yeah. they don't and a lot of those don't even offer a preamp mode it's just right. preamp your outputs are always hot so if you plug them in you got you got power going to your amp, external amplification great question ty i got nothing to add Ultra Boosted says, Youth Man, should I go for an older Orion amp? Oh, wow. I haven't heard Orion since I was in car audio. Yeah, old Orion subs. I remember yeah, I mean, those. I used to, I've seen some guys have these big old massive Orion amplifiers, you know, 1,500, 2,000 watt amps, um, oh, yeah. or a newer Pioneer. So I'm a little confused um, because you say amplifier, and sometimes we use amp and AVR, which is audio video um receiver kind of interchangeably um i'm not aware of orion making anything really for home theater typically those are going to be like four ohm two ohm half ohm um and you it's going to be weird hooking that up because they're normally hooked up to an actual car battery so i'm not real sure uh my guess no i wouldn't really worry about orion if you're looking for avrs pioneer makes a great avr um, there's, Do you think you know, the noise floor is going to be acceptable? 
<clears throat> What's that? On something like that old of an ant? frozen. Just right. frozen. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> In a Napoleon yeah. Dynamite pose. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me fix it. Hold on. I was wondering. I like, like it. Wait a minute. What's going on here? <laughs> uh, hold on. Yeah. I, again, I don't, I don't think you're going to really be able to intermix that type of an amplifier. Um, I don't think they make anything in the home theater space. So I would be more apt to tell you, get something newer. Um, when you buy older AVRs, especially, the biggest issue isn't the amount of power. It's, it's the features and it's the processing. So you're not going to have any kind of support for even things like Dolby True HD, which is high resolution audio or something like DTS Master, which is high-resolution audio. Even if you're not going to like a Dolby Atmos format, I still always recommend at least get a, an AVR that can support those two formats. If not, I mean, if you're back in the 90s, man, you're, you're back in Dolby Pro Logic days, and I'll be honest, it wasn't that good. Um, it was cool, but it, it really was not that good. So I would re I'd recommend you getting kind of <clears throat> something newer than Orion for sure. Spencer says, I've been ask, asking some sub-related questions lately and was asking about the JTR 2400. If I use the 2400 up front, would it pair well if I kept my two PB 3000s and use them as rear subwoofers? So both of those are ported. So the PB 3000, the JTR 2400, I think it worked fine. Um, the JTR is probably going to way out perform them. Um, but I think it can definitely maybe help fill in some of the uh, maybe if you've got some nulls in your room in your frequency response. Um, but the PB3000, that's I love that sub. They've got great output. Um, I think you could you could utilize all three of those. What do you think? Yeah, you're just going to have to keep the volume uh, in check on those rear PB3000 mm -hmm. so they don't make bad noise or distort as you mm -hmm. to what the 2400 can handle. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's something you can do. So, I mean, yeah, you can play with that. And just see, yeah. you, see how it works. Just yeah. don't overdrive the PB three thousands trying to keep up with the twenty four hundred. Yeah. yeah. But I think it, I don't think I don't see any glaring issues. The only time I, a lot of times, what we'll see is somebody has, let's say, an older. I'm just gonna pick on a, a brand, an older Sony subwoofer, and they're like, yeah, can that pair well with? my pb 16s and I'm gonna there's like, nothing wrong with sony as a brand <laughs> yeah yeah their subwoofers are horrible um <laughs> maybe they're subs they, they, i'm they're, trying they're... to save face here and be nice <laughs> not... sony, I, I love you guys y'all make great product Your subwoofers that dealer, are not... that dealer mindset <laughs> they're, they're not uh on the top of my list for sure but you know it's those type of mix mass matches you're not going to begin oh my gosh i can't speak you're not going to benefit from adding a super, super entry level, hundred dollars, hundred fifty dollars sub with a fifteen hundred, a two thousand, a four thousand dollars subwoofer. It just, it can't keep up physically. But I think the PB three thousands, they're definitely a quality subwoofer, and I think they can, they can add something to that equation. But they're not going to be the level of the twenty four hundred for sure. There's a caveat there too. I'm assuming since you're saying front and rear that you have two distinct subwoofer outs. Mm, okay. And if you don't, you probably shouldn't do this. Yeah. If you without <clears throat> external devices like a mini DSP or something. Mm -hmm. If you do have two distinct outputs, then yeah, run subwoofer one for the twenty four hundred and subwoofer two for your two PV three thousands in close proximity or equal distance yeah. from your listening position. That's if he's EQing. What do you mean? If he's not EQing, it shouldn't I mean you can put do EQ directly on the PB three thousand, can't you? Oh, on the on the amplifier? Do they have yeah. a little phone app on those? Yeah, yeah. There's three channel PEQ on there, so, so I you think can do a little bit of adjustment. You could do a little bit of adjustment, and then mm -hmm. potentially just let the JTR twenty four hundred B if he yeah. only has one sub yeah, out. And Spencer said he does have two sub outs. Thanks okay. for always leading you me down go. the right path. You know that JTR sub is going to make you smile. I, I'm dude, excited for you. I'm excited for him, dude. Yeah, they're a different tier, man. You're gonna get yeah. that. And you're gonna be like, "Holy smokes!" Yeah, I'm looking forward. Be to careful that about foundation MWIP. damage. What's that, Jordan? I said I'm looking forward to hearing JTR at, at MWIP because I haven't haven't experienced them. Before, oh, baby, so. nice. Um, yeah, so we're gonna have a full JTR setup at MWIP. Nice. Like, big what's the tower? most subs you've ever heard in a room? 16, 18s. 
<laughs> well, I know I'm asking Jordan, not Jordan. you, Jonathan. Yeah. I, I know we're all great. Does Sheldon have those set up now? No, I don't think okay. yet. He's waiting for some boxes from Doug, but they're getting close. I Jordan, I, I know I you mentioned it. I know you mentioned you're only going to be able to make it one day. If you at all possible can make it a couple of days, I promise you, dude. It may be life. It'll be life changing. The good thing is you're single. Yeah. So you don't have to. You don't have to impress anybody. <laughs> all the money that comes in can go to you. Are you saying we're a bad influence on people? You're a horrible influence <laughs> on wallets. Um, no. And the only I'm reason serious. I say Here. one day is because I've been. I've been traveling a lot this year. And yeah. so, I mean, I have, I have really good vacation days, but M wave. And then like a couple months later is uh, CDS. So I'm going to try to go to that again in Colorado and then, you know, try to take off some time. So, but yeah, I'll definitely try, hopefully try to make two days, but I would yeah, say the most subs that I've heard, I, I want to say it was at CDS. I think there was okay. one room that had like eight subs or something in there. Was so the turnoff room, uh, Oh, they did have a lot in the no, no, I'm sorry. It was I, I didn't actually didn't get to see the turnout route. That line was ridiculous, man. Yeah. I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't get over I there. Felt bad should you people. pulled you should have pulled your media card. Like, <laughs> yo, man. <laughs> right. And it was actually that was the first time I saw Ryan, but I didn't get a t chance to talk to him because he was like I could tell on his face he was just like he he was wiped, man. There was just lines. I mean, the line was just ridiculous. That was probably our, the longest line at that. Our thing. line was going through two other booths. Yep, yeah. it was it was crazy. So I was like, yeah. I'm not even going to bother trying to get in that line, much less you know talk to him because he's busy. I think, but I think the wait time was like an amusement park ride. It was like an hour yeah, and a half. It, it, just it, it was quite a while, the, sure. just to get into the experience. Sure. But Sheldon so, will have sixteen eighteens. Goodness. This year, I'll have 16, five. 18s. I'll have five four thousands. Um, Jonathan has eight eighteens. That is insane. Grant has two orbit <laughs> shifters. But here's the crazy thing, though. Like, I mean, you think about eight eighteens. Like, who needs eight eighteens? No one. It's amazing. I mean, I'm serious. It's it's not <laughs> it's not one of those things where you're like, okay, because here's what most people think. They see something like eight eighteens, and they're like, that's got to be horrible because it's just so much bass. It's overwhelming actually quite the opposite you get sweet bass no matter where you're at in the room because you've got so many subwoofers but then on top of that it doesn't matter what content these guys are playing in their setup they've got so much headroom that they're just like coasting along man i mean they can hit some massive spls the sheet rocker foundation may not feel that way but yeah know. they're they're not even i mean honestly they're not even flexing you know and not to pick on the PB3000s we were talking about <clears throat> earlier, but let's say you've got two PB3000s. I mean, they're going hardcore. I mean, they're giving everything they can to give you that tactile feeling. And Jonathan's are over there, you know, sipping a, a Celsius going, oh, good, man. <laughs> you know, and they're just, they're not breaking a sweat kind of no. thing. And, and so there's definitely a benefit of having multiple subwoofers. What did you start with, Jonathan? Like, I mean, obviously, I'm assuming you didn't start with eight eight teams. <clears throat> no, I, I'm like you guys. I was started back in high school with like a pawn shop, a pawn shop subwoofer. You know, mm -hmm. uh, my first good subs were Infinity HPS 1000s, yeah, which were beastie subs. Yeah. I had a pair of those in college that I bought off UBID. If you guys ever remember that site. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't even um, remember that. I paid about 500 a piece. They were retail 1800 a piece. <laughs> So I, and we had a lot of good, good times with those. And yeah. then I went to captivators and there's some other subs in the middle there. I like, I'm leaving some of that, but I'm just hitting highlights. JTR yeah. captivators I had for a few years and loved those. And then I went to these eight, 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 eight teens. Uh, when I ventured off the reservation a little bit and tried some things like Jamo D sevens, I think they were. Did you uh, just say Jamo? Mm -hmm. Jamo yeah, or Jamo? Yamo. <laughs> I I did the same thing. Oh, why not a Jamo? Oh, a they Jamo. weren't very good, so I didn't. Jonathan, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Yamo. That's my understanding. It, I just put those a uh, funny story here. I put those in a subwoofer shootout in 2011 or 2012. Oh, Jonathan, in DC. Oh. A pair of them. One of them died during the subwoofer shootout, Ooh. Oh, and, the, yeah. and the other one died. The other one died like a week later when I watched Tron Legacy. So they just weren't. Their that sounds about right. <laughs> we pushed them hard, and they and they didn't do it. So mm. what what is the like? What is your favorite bass demo to to really utilize your your subs in your room? Like if you could pick one movie or one scene, 
Are we trying to destroy the subwoofer or to showcase what it can do? Uh, let's do both. Tell me both. So, <laughs> I was asking about showcase, but I'm interested to see what would actually destroy that. So there's, I mean, there's both types of stuff that I like. I like a lot of tactile bass of different frequencies and a movie like, uh, what is it? Day After Tomorrow with um, mm, Tom. Wow. Yeah, I know which one you're talking about. What? Uh, yes. Tom Cruise? Tom Cruise. That one's got incredible bass, if you guys give that one a listen. If you just want meaty, deep, thick bass, War of the Worlds is a classic one. Notice how he That's casually crazy. glanced over the destroying your subwoofer for one in <laughs> Day After Tomorrow with the intro, <laughs> the intro scene. Is that how your Yamo subs gave up the ghost? Tron Legacy is how the Yamos died. That's a good one for, for bass, too. Um, Interstellar's got a great explosion, like a blast-off scene. I, I like different things. I like music. I my frequency response is very flat, like I told you. So I like having that that very equitable sound with all the different notes in the range. And um, I don't know. I don't like like Michael says. I don't play it super loud. I'm not mm. I'm not trying to take the drywall down. I just no. like to have the I like a smooth sound through all the seats, and yeah. I like it to be re reproduced correctly. So. Yeah. And it, it does. It's amazing, man. So we've got some VIPs that are going to have a chance to experience your <clears> setup. <throat> Ryan set up, and then we've got two more home theaters. It's going to be a packed day Ryan's on that Thursday. Children. There's four, so it's going to be pretty awesome. So I'll give you one little other little pointer here. The first time I experienced sealed mm -hmm. subs and the capacity that made me think, like, whoa, mm -hmm. there's something to them. And I think I've probably shared this, Michael, before. Yeah. X-Men First Class at the near the end of the movie where uh, Magneto is controlling the missiles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like he's redirecting all the missiles that the carriers are fired off or the destroyers are fired off, and he right. sends them back. Right. There is some sort of incredible low rumble on that su that scene that just makes you smile. Like it's yeah. just so impressive. Sure. And I didn't. I had those JTR ported caps that were 20 hertz tunes, the mm -hmm. amazing subs. Yeah. But they didn't do that like 10, 12 hertz yeah. stuff. You know, with yeah. the missiles turning, it just yeah. there was nothing. Sure. When I got those when I got those sealed subs and I started listening, to that, I was like. Whoa, there's yeah, something yeah, even yeah. those captivators didn't, you know, right. work creating. Yeah. Which so, captivators were those? They were the ca JTR Captivator Pro. They were 20 oh, hertz right. tuned. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. All of his pro stuff is higher tuned. Yeah, because mm -hmm. they're a different application there. It is. I love yeah. those. I have nothing bad to say about them. No. They just don't but, dig that's a, but 10 hertz is a full octave less than 20 hertz because the right. doubling of frequency is an octave. Yeah. So there are notes in home theater. Yeah. 100%. Oh, there's I'm, a lot. I've watched the Ready Player One scene at at home theaters that because just about every home theater I go to, they're like, "Oh, let's check out Ready Player One." I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> here we go again." And I like the scene, I really do. But you know, it's a scene where it's the race scene, and when you have Kong, or I'm sorry, when the dinosaur steps down, when those wrecking balls come in, and when Kong lands on the on the freeway, there's some pretty low sticking notes there, and there's a lot of subwoofers that. You'll hear it when he lands, but then it just whoop, like it, there's just nothing underneath. And then you go hear a capable system that's well below 20 hertz, like 15 hertz, 10 hertz. I don't know what frequency it is, but that's a whole different experience for sure. Mm -hmm. um, me and Jessica or Jessica and I just watched last night. Um, you actually I, used uh, your theater. I did. So here's, <laughs> wow. here's the, here's the, here's the, it's been clean since like what all my say? stuff. We cleaned up big time when Tony and, and Jeff from JTR came and we installed the 110 slants. So I've been able to manage that pretty well. And I use my daughter's adjacent room to kind of keep it's like storage, you know. So I've got subwoofer boxes and there's speaker boxes and amplifiers and stuff um, while she's at college. And so normally Jessica loves chick flicks. And so when we watch a movie, it's a boring movie, it's not an action kind of movie. Um, so I don't get to crank it up or anything, but I asked her, I said, she said, Hey, why don't we watch national treasure? So national treasure is an older movie, Nick cage. Great movie. I love the story. It's got some good action in it, but I said, you know, we've seen that movie a bunch, especially many, many, many years ago. Um, I'm thinking, wait a minute. What if we watch, um, uncharted? Cause that's kind of very similar in the style, you know, they're hunting for treasure. They're having to figure out clues and, but it's got some current Dolby Atmos effects and we could really have some fun with this. So we watched it last night and we watched about 10 dB below reference.
which is about where I usually watch it. And there's some deep notes in that. I mean, big time. And so definitely, you know, don't skimp on your subwoofers, guys. I no. mean, seriously, that is one area that I always recommend. It's like, don't skimp on that because there's so much like there's so much that a good quality subwoofer that can handle below 20 hertz. There's just some stuff down there that's a lot, a lot of fun. So, yep. and I don't, I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's a horrible movie, but the audio on Moonfall is excellent. Mm. Yep, I haven't seen but that. The, that, God, movie, that movie it's, it's was bad. bad. It's so <laughs> bad. I, it was, a, it was a blind buy for me. I do that for oh, time. Oh, so time. bad. And yeah. I heard my coworker told me it was bad, and I was like, right. I've seen some bad movies. It can't be that bad. The first like. <laughs> eight minutes is great and then it just mm. it just goes downhill and it just it's like they going. ran at a budget and it just yes. deteriorated and i feel physically. the same thing about um jupiter so sending oh, i bought Jupiter's that one bad jupiter I sending's worse just, I jonathan's just... laughing he's like these are my favorite movies <laughs> <laughs> i bought jupiter sending because people said hey it's not that great of a movie but there's some good demo quality yeah. in there bad. and so i, I did so i bought cool. it i was like oh yeah this movie's trash was there any demo quality stuff oh, in yeah. there it's there's some in there's, there's a couple scenes. Yeah, it, it's bad. It's not, Anything. It's, not it's okay. Yeah. What well, is not? Put it this way. I've never used that when somebody came over for a demo. No. Hey, you want to turn on Jupiter Ascending? I just I, don't see that I've working. I've never out. heard that. I yeah. forget the actor's name. It's but like saying, "Hey, you want a demo bad. Legally Blonde?" It just doesn't doesn't work. <laughs> what is your home theater nerd? Appreciate the five dollars super chat. Um, have any of you guys tried manual speaker calibration? Not just your subs. If so, what method did you use? Great question, man. So I'm an auto EQ kind of guy. So I haven't dove into manual calibration. And part of that is, like I said earlier, my theater room is kind of always in transition because I'm typically like, I need to remove my AVR now, my Marantz AV7706, and I need to install a uh, Anthem AVM70. And so... I'm always swapping out stuff, so I don't have time to learn a manual calibration. Um, but you guys, I think some of y'all use manual, correct? And actually, I think, Jonathan, you don't really use any kind of... I don't use part, any auto EQ, EQ but yeah. I do. I, like I mentioned earlier, I tailor in a little bit of manual EQ just to make a little bit of a smiley face. Tiny, But that's mo mostly on your subs, or do you EQ That's on the main speakers. Topics? All 13 are... are EQ the exact same way. Just a, face. just a hint of smiley face. So just you, I, a, we've a had this smirk. discussion. You know, every single one of you knows that's how you did your graphic equalizer when you had that on your radio. I know it. I did it too. Probably yeah, still everybody did. I had one. I'm too young. Yeah, <laughs> I had one. Mine definitely. Mine look like a big smile. John, think yeah. yours is probably more like a smirk. Mine's just just a little smirk. That's right. A little Ryan smile. I like this. A little Ryan mine's upside smile. Down. Just mine's, a, mine's a frown. <laughs> Turn that frown upside down. No Boom. bass, no. Oh, no highs, no lows. You must. Never mind. We both. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> Shots fired. I, yeah, um, I've, I've done EQ on my mains, but I just leave them be. Okay. So you let them ride the way they are? Let them ride. Jordan? Yeah. So recently, last couple of months, I've been turning, I've been doing some demoing, turning off. I have Arch Genesis and I like it. I just, okay. all of these these you know room correction softwares i've never liked what they do to the highs and the bass mm. and so yeah. i've actually been turning it off and then i tried the spatial audio toolkit that's actually really good they've got some really good stuff on there right now i'm not r running any room correction just because i like the way that it sounds but then you turn like for me i have quite a few quite a few dips and like nulls and peaks in my theater so it's kind of mm -hmm. like I need to try REW. I've never tried it. And honestly, it's a little bit intimidating for me, but it's something that I want to get into. But right now I'm just not using anything, you know, as far as, you know, auto room correction. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. And that's a good thing. The, you can turn these things on and off, try it with, try it without. It's going to vary depending on your room. Some room correction do a better job um, in certain rooms and other rooms. Sometimes they'll, they'll really destroy the sound. And so it actually may sound better without, any kind of auto correction. Um, but the great thing about this hobby, get in there and don't be scared to play around. Uh, make some subtle adjustments, listen to it for a while. Did that make a positive change or a negative change? You can always go back to what you had, especially if you've got something like um, the Anthem products, Monolith, the HTP1, the, uh, a lot of the Denon and Marantz, they have 
Um, if you use like the Odyssey app, you can save that and load that as a kind of like a profile in a way or a preset um, and even switch between presets to go A and B. Do I like that change with, without, and then, you know, tailor it to your needs in your room. So I do want to go back and say, because I said I'd let them ride. I think it's still very important to make sure that you SPL and time align your speakers, yep, regardless sure. if you're EQing. Yeah. If you don't do that, you're right. going to have a mess, yeah, regardless sure. of what's happening. So it's very important that time alignment and SPL matching right. take place. Otherwise, right. you're going to have a rough time. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I love this before we jump to the next question. I ordered one JTR speaker because they aren't cheap. Uh, it's a 210RM for a center channel. Can't wait. And then SRW1000, they're like lace potato chips. You can't stop with just one. <laughs> That's I a good it. point. I, you're just opening your... Why would you do that to yourself? <laughs> oh, these are too expensive. I'm just going to buy one to try it out. <laughs> That's awesome, that man. Yeah. Um, and then he says the Monolith HTB1. Somebody else mentioned that the other day. They're back in stock. So if yep. you're looking for a processor... There was a pricing 16, mistake on those last week. Yeah. There was cool. was it? How much? 3400 as opposed to what's the current four, price? Four. Okay. Wow. Snap. Got a youth were, man deal. For were they honoring else. it? I don't know. Mm. Yeah, it was on the forums. People were saying the coupon usually has the exclusion listed for the HTTP one, but it didn't have yeah. that exclusion this time when they run that 15% off coupon. Interesting. Sure. Awesome. Let's jump back here. All right, JD the expert. So JD the expert shared with us a couple of weeks ago. He's 17 years old, man. I love that. I love seeing new guys get into the hobby. So appreciate you being here and you got great questions. Is there perhaps a way that we could do a 7.1, like you said, about the signal split with the subwoofers? Not too sure if it'll work with heights. I think he was specifically asking, there was part of this question, like <clears throat> oh, he has right a here. six channel amplifier or something. Yep. There we go. So his dad had a six channel amp and he could do that 7.1, but he originally wanted to do a 7.1 by having 5.1. We have the height speakers. You could run a phantom center. I've never been a big fan of phantom centers. Me personally. Me either. Me either. I'm just throwing out possibilities here. I, I didn't know. say it was I the know. best way. You're compromising. Yeah. I mean, my 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 recommendation would, you know, figure out how many speakers you want in your room and then begin to build a system around that. Even if you've got to buy something in the used market, there's some great deals to be had. Even literally 400 bucks, you could buy an AVR that'll power a 7.1 or a 9.1 um, may not support Dolby Atmos, and that's okay. Save up some money over time. Now you can upgrade that AVR to something that does support Atmos. Add your, your height channels and so forth. So, again, don't be scared to build this over time. You don't have to have your, your yeah. system fully implemented. And used <clears throat> equipment is solid. Like, yeah, I've got a stack of Behringer A800s that there you go. There's guys all over the place that have used yeah. gear. That yeah, amps, amps will last you a lifetime. Decades. As long as good amps. Yeah. 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 yeah as long a lot as of good amps ones. will last you, at least for decades. Maybe not a yeah. lifetime. Not a lifetime, but I mean, you know, 10, 15 years, you should be able to get a, That's a, a short lifetime, amp. brother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying at least. <laughs> yeah. 10, 15 year lifetime, man. <laughs> That's a young age, man. I don't want to die when I'm 15. I'm glad I didn't die when I'm 15. <laughs> right. That guy's yeah. 17. That's right, man. Bob Smith, question here. He says, what sound level do you set the AVR to before doing direct calibration? So my understanding, it doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about setting your volume to reference and then running it. Direct you do all knows of that in the direct software when you're level matching the speakers. <clears throat> and direct knows how to do it. Pretty much all of them. Onkyo, I don't think any of them you have to set a certain. Because even in their walkthrough, mm -hmm. like they'll tell you, okay, here's what I want you to do. Not one of those um, room correction softwares have no. I ever seen a prompt. Hey, set your volume to this. It automatically does. You're that going to have to level match during the direct setup. Like Correct. You level match all of your systems and you have to set your main gain level to a certain. So there you're kind of setting it in a way. Right. But, but it's not the receiver. You're volume. not setting the volume dial to any yep. set thing. You're doing it actually in the direct calibration suite. Oh, sure. Don says, how was PS Audio? I think it, he's, I think he's talking about the Expona. PS Audio room. I didn't, I didn't yeah. get to hear okay. that one. Okay. Don's okay. another local in Florida. Um, 
Large Michael says, does Perlison have their in ceiling speakers available available no. yet? Brian? No. no. They had the in walls at Expona, but they keep pushing them back. Mm. Um, and that's okay. because Dan really wants to get them right. And Dan is a stickler for making sure that he dots all of his I's and crosses all of his T's. Mm. And they just keep getting pushed back. And I think that's good because yeah, he wants to make sure that thing. they're yeah. well designed yeah. and they meet the level that all of the other Perlison speakers. Yeah. have come to acclaim. So yeah. I want to say right now, that. he's actually looking at after the summer. Mm -hmm. I f this is just what I remember. I want to say he was thinking around Cedia time now. Mm -hmm. So September-ish. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. Great question there, man. Johnny, what's up, youth man? Ryan, Jonathan, and Jordan. Question, will Triad be at M-Wave this year? Thanks for, or thanks, loving the show. See you all at M-Wave. So Johnny's going to be joining us. I've actually talked to him on the phone, man. Super nice guy. Looking forward to meeting you in person. Glad you're making it to M-Wave. Triad at this point, um, we do not have them on the books for M-Wave. If you don't know what M-Wave is, I'll just send a link right here, or at least the address, Midwest AV Experience. Ryan and I are putting on uh, our second year of this, July 14th through the 16th. And so you can find all the vendors that are on, that are going to be there at the show at midwestavexperience.com, but Triad is not one of those as of right now. Theo says, will there be any coverage of M-Wave? Absolutely, great question. So part of the struggle last year was I was, Ryan and I, first year doing M-Wave. So I was so busy trying to help run some of the cali or the um, comparisons. I was doing the speaker comparison, making sure we had food. I mean, we were doing all kinds of things connecting with you guys on a personal level. And so I just really felt the need not to make content. Um, and even you looking back, time. yeah, looking back, I don't think that was a, that was a mistake. Now, do I wish I had footage to be able to promote this year's event from last year? Partly yes, but the reality is that looks a lot different than what this year is going to look like. Yes. Like really, really different, especially with the venue that we've got now. Last year was training wheels. We <laughs> learned was. a lot. Yeah. There were a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Um, it went really, really well. And everybody yeah. really enjoyed it. The vendors really enjoyed it. Everybody that was there is coming back this year. Yeah. I think it's it was a great thing. It was yeah. just to this year is much much larger we, we're taking this thing to a whole new level adding a bunch one more. of the biggest things with that was making sure that michael has the opportunity to go yeah. around and do what he needs to do yeah. which is why kyle's emceeing this year and yeah. he's orchestrating things i don't think he knows what he's in for but <laughs> it allows me to not have to worry about being in front of people i can do what i need to do right. michael can do what he needs to do right. and we're not worried about any of that other yeah. stuff yeah and so the big debate right now is, you know, will and we've also invited a lot of content creators, so they're going to be making content, and that's up to them, you know, if if they find something that they just really think would be a value to their audience, they're going to share it with them. Um, so definitely subscribe to all these guys, subscribe to Jordan's channel, Haterade Cowboy. Um, and like I said, there's probably about six or seven content creators that are going to be there. Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner. Um, Home Theater Gamer will be there. He'll actually be helping me with, with filming. Um, I've spoken with Chris Majestic. He possibly might be there. He said he wants to come. Um, so he might be there. That's still, I haven't gotten 100% confirmation from him. Uh, I know I'm forgetting a handful. I've got a list Stop of the them. FOMO. Is he coming this Stop year? FOMO's going to be back this year. And he so, actually, I can't remember who else, but there's another content creator coming with him, supposedly. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Actually, I've got the list right here. Brian Stout from Woody Sound Up is going to be there. Yeah, Brian's exactly. a super, super nice guy. Kyle Life of Bliss, he'll be helping us out. Mike Perez with Mike's on Audio said he's coming. Uh, I think him and his fiance, I believe, is going to be there. So that's no super idea. cool. Yeah, and I was going to say, I can I can volunteer as tribute. I can do some stuff if you guys want me to. Oh, yeah. no. um, Jordan doesn't know what he's getting himself into. <laughs> So, but yeah, so I think there'll be plenty of coverage this year, whether or not it'll be live stream, whether it'll be after the fact and it's edited video or a combination of both. Um, you live know, stream is hard, especially if you yeah. want like quality. quality that was the content. struggle. And and it, I guess that could even be a, a topic of discussion maybe briefly, but I know that 
Ryan was asking like, Hey man, we really need to have live stream. Um, I'm not sure that there's a huge value there. I see some value, but I, in my viewpoint, I would rather have kind of a polished video to where I can show you kind of like highlights of it and the best parts versus a lot of dead space of me walking from one room to the other room and trying to fill in the gaps. Um, I don't know. I, I think I see value in both, but I'm not, I don't necessarily. And the other thing is like when you're streaming, sometimes you run into the issue of the Wi-Fi signal. But the other thing is you're going to be limited in the quality of the stream. Yep. So video wise, it's not amazing. Um, it doesn't give me an opportunity to set up lighting in the room so that it looks better. Uh, I'm literally would be walking in with auto exposure, letting the camera do whatever it can in that lighting environment. Then on top of that, then you've got copyright issues, you know, so there's just so many pieces to that. So, but definitely I think there'll be content. Absolutely. I just don't know exactly, um, you know, if it's going to be live stream, uh, it'll definitely be pre-recorded and posted later on after the event. Um, and I might be able to even upload like, especially like some shorts and stuff. Those would be super easy to do because I don't have to edit those. Um, and of course, Instagram posts will be up there. Uh, Woody sound up. He does a great job at posting, you know, during an event. And then DCAS says, is there a venue yet for the event? Absolutely. All the information is on the website. So we will be at the Kansas City Convention Center, which we are extremely excited about that. The Kansas City Convention Center is going to open up really huge opportunities for us to be able to provide, like I shared earlier, full Dolby Atmos. I mean, some some brands like JTR are bringing a 7.2.6 Dolby Atmos setup with big, massive speakers in a big room. Um, we've got some uh, subwoofer brands like GSG Audio. If you saw my community post the other day, uh, let me see if I can pull up that picture. They're bringing some big old bad boy subwoofers. So we're excited about that. Stereo Integrity is bringing some massive, what, 20, is it 24 inch? 24 inch field. 24 inch, yeah. So we've got massive subwoofers there. Let me go to What's this. What's the picture. biggest room you guys have? Is it the 7.2.6? Yes. No, Perlison may have more. Bigger than the 7.26, though? It, it's possible. Okay. It I'm may down. be a, I, I don't know how, how many they're talking about bringing their Munich room, which oh, I think, okay. I think maybe 11. Nice. So life of bliss posted this the other day. He yeah, shared it with that. me on a text and I said, Hey, can I share that? He's like, absolutely. And then he made a post about it. So he's gotten a whole palette from GSG audio. So we're looking at, um, dual 21 inch subwoofer. So that was just recently announced. That'll be at M wave. He's going to bring it. They've got a new dual 18 inch subwoofer, which is pretty awesome. Um, and then he's got some 24 inch. I think he has one 24 inch subwoofer and then he's got one 21 inch driver, but then I think they're shipping him another one. So he's going to have some subwoofers like kind of like flat packs. I think that he's going to be building or maybe he's building his own. That part I don't know. Um, I, th I think on his post on his channel, I think he said it's that's over like 800 pounds, isn't it? All right. Like, yes, he did. Uh, Life of bliss. No, I think you guys can still see this, right? Yeah. All right. Let's go over to his community tab. Biggest shipment I've received to date, 859 pounds yes. of weaponized MDF from GSG Audio. The <clears throat> new dual 21, dual 18, and sealed 24 enclosures. There's only one of the two-inch eminence drivers on there, so figure another 350 pounds in drivers missing from the total weigh-in. I'll be <clears throat> doing build videos for That's each of insane. these as well as some testing afterwards which will uh, feature gsg's own monster 18 that they're finishing up for production i'm gonna check these out in person of course will be featured at m wave 2023 in kansas city missouri july 14th through the 16th and then you can head to the website for more info and to grab tickets so we are super pumped about that look at that dude oh he's got a couple photos Oh, I didn't even see the other photos. I just saw the one. Yeah, so one thing, when you see these little icons down here, that lets you know there's more. Whoa, what's up with this guy? He's got one like me. <laughs> I think he's hey. doing that. <laughs> Tyler, man. His kids are awesome, too, man. 
Talon and Blake. Yeah, I love Life of Bliss, man. He's going to be there helping us out, having some fun. So love to have you guys join us. All right, back to the questions. <clears throat> Evangeliste says, hey, guys, can you please also help the average home theater owner? We can't all buy JTR or SVS subs. What about a good, inexpensive sub below $500? Uh, who can go lower than 20 hertz? Bic, Kustek, mm, Acoust that's, Acoustic, You're going to find that. PL300. PL300 won't do it. Mm -mm. Yeah, so I think that's going to be the struggle. Um, yeah, why? My, my advice, yeah. So my advice, if you've got 500 bucks, okay, I would either look at building your own subwoofer. You can buy a really quality subwoofer for like what, 300 bucks, 300 bucks. 400 bucks, something like that. Maybe 18. Yeah. 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 So about $300, you know, let's just say you got 200 in an amplifier. Um, I think you can build a solid system and we're talking probably what an 18 inch driver. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're going to easily hit with well the wood. You, if you're, this is, if you're handy mm -hmm. with the wood, you're probably at what? 550, 600. Okay. With the amp, you guys are like, that's getting pretty hard to do. Mm -hmm. You'd have to okay. find a used okay. amp. You, you go on eBay and you buy a I have some Behringer's he's doing youth band deals on. They that's won't drive car. that. <laughs> what are those? What are those? I mean, it's more than $500, but it's $1,000. Those Stark sounds that they're doing, the uh, the buy one, get one free, do those go below 20 Yeah, hertz? but you're not going to get them for 500 bucks, are you? Yeah, no, I'm just saying, but I mean, yeah. for $500 more, you can get two. We saw those over at uh, Enzo Kit's room. Ryan, weren't they going down to like 10 or 15 hertz in his room? The Stark sound? Yes. Mm -hmm. Which room? He he got them. The guy that borrowed your RTJ subs for a moment to try them. I wasn't there when you guys went over the to do them. So we measured them. I'm trying to remember if they were flat down at 10 or 15 hertz. They they were in that in that range. Um. They they did a remarkably good job, I think, for the price. So they're about five hundred bucks a piece. That's a good call. Now it does it it is important to remember that that's flat down to ten or fifteen hertz at a certain SPL. If you start really pushing it, yeah. they're probably going to fall distorted. off rather quickly. But right. it's that's a really good deal. Those Starks. If I had the money, I would. I, I probably would get them eventually. But that's I've never seen a company do that before. So that one is it's when is this? It's the pre-order one is sold out, and the pre-order two ships June thirtieth, twenty twenty-three. I'm looking at their site. I mean, the, it's got a nine hundred watt amp. It's got a fifteen inch driver. It's a sealed subwoofer. That's not a bad way to go if no. you're Just if you're uh, you know if that's your price range. That's not a bad choice at all. That's that'd be what I would do at that price point. Yeah. And people, I mean, I haven't heard any, there's not a whole lot of reviews on them, but I haven't heard anyone say anything bad about them. Where did Michael go? No, he just said he was going to be back. Mm -hmm. I'm back. I heard you. My Celsius, uh, it had to come out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. So I would do the Starks Evangelist. Yeah, I don't. So here's the my only dilemma with that. Okay, when somebody says, "Hey, I need good, inexpensive subs," it's really difficult for us to say, "Oh, go buy these. It's twice as much as your budget." I think well, the Starks are two for. You pay a thousand and you yeah. get they're five hundred each. I yeah. get that, but unless he's able to sell one for five hundred bucks, he's not. Well, most then you're you're not going to get to below lower than correct. twenty hertz for that price point. Correct. Yeah. So I, I mean, maybe I guess, with room gain with like an SVS sub or some maybe. Yeah. So I think that's one of the things where I always recommend when you've got a low budget and I, and $500 is a lot of money, no doubt. But in the subwoofer world, when some are costing a thousand or 1500 or something like that, or even more 500 is definitely on the low end of that spectrum. When you have a $500 budget, I've always been a big fan of going used is you can find some really good deals in a used market, whether it's somebody that built one in the DIY community um, or get an older subwoofer 
The hard part with older subwoofers, though, is eventually those amplifiers typically start to, to fail on you. Um, I've had my share. But the good thing is if you find good youth man deals, I think all I used to have um, four. I'll pull it up here. Um, well, that, that wouldn't even. Never well, mind. That's not let even me right. back up and because Evangelist says Audioholics tested the Bic PL300. And they did. I'm looking mm -hmm. at the measurements right now. Yeah. What's important to remember here is that <clears throat> really any subwoofer is going more than not any, but a lot of subwoofers are going to be able to create sound mm -hmm. below 20 hertz. Will it necessarily be audible? Maybe, maybe not. Will it be able to keep up if you start pushing the volume? Most definitely not. not. Mm -hmm. So like in this case, you've got 25 hertz for... The, if you're going port open with bass boost is 99.8 and then 20 Hertz is 93.6. And then below that is not, it's yeah. distortion limited. Yeah. And if you port plug it 101 at 25, 96 at 20, 90 at 16, and you can see how Here's it's a off. massive output. Yeah. And the thing Big to remember drop. is that with the lower <laughs> frequencies, you typically have to boost them in order for them to sound even with the rest of the frequency range. Yeah. So if it's falling off, and your speakers are able to be play up here, but your sub's able to only do here, yep. you're going to notice. So yeah. what's actually looking mm -hmm. like in the frequency response is it's doing this. And then yeah. as it encroaches 20, it's going to start doing this and then it's just going to fall off a cliff. So yeah. yes, a lot of this stuff can play down below 20, but that doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean that it's going to be a solid experience. Now yeah. it would be if you only listen at maybe 80 dB, maybe, mm -hmm. and then it would be applicable. There's nothing wrong with that, but most people, my guests that are watching this channel, mm -hmm. probably don't listen at that low a level. Yeah. So especially sure. with subwoofers, because if your speakers are at 80, the subs are probably going to be playing, I would imagine, 10 dB hotter than that mm -hmm. um, at a guesstimate. So yeah. I just think you're, it's, it's going to be show. a, a I mean, the big, experience. Yeah. The, unfortunately, the BIC isn't, it's definitely your what I would consider an entry level subwoofer and nothing wrong with that. You just have to have some realistic expectations to, it's to a great ask, sub for the price point to ask that subwoofer to play content. That's lower than 20 Hertz is going to be rough. Brett has a good suggestion. He said the SVS SB. So that's sealed 2000 is only $500. So that might be an option. It does 19 Hertz in room response. You definitely could even get a little bit lower than that. Might get down to like 16 Hertz. It's 500 watts in RMS. Andrew said he got a great deal secondhand used market PSA XS30 SE with a blown amp. Okay. So maybe that's a good deal. Okay. Then he added. So he picked up the PSA sub, had a blown amp for 150 AUD is what? Australia? Uh, yes. Whatever currency. I think it's Australian currency. And then shipping hand. Uh, Shipping handling? Second hand. Man, all these abbreviations I'm going to figure out. Second hand Yamaha XP 7000 amp for 300 bucks, um, And then used mini DSP. I think it did well with what it cost him. Um, Eric suggests maybe even an RSL 12S. So, and I love this right here. Just save your coin and what you really want. So determine what, what that end goal is. Is it sub 20 hertz? Find a sub that's capable of that. Find somebody that's taken some measurements of it. Um, and then just say, yeah, something I think we're kind of glossing over here is how big is his room? True. Yeah. If you're still in the chat, uh, let us know how big your room is. Um, especially if you're only looking at one subwoofer, uh, to pressurize a room and to get substantial sub 20. So again, that's, that might be, that might be a lofty goal, but it might not be a realistic goal. So Jonathan, you got that, anything? Yeah, you know, Audioholics has reviewed both these subs, the SW15 and the PL300, but um, I haven't had a chance to study it, so mm -hmm. I don't, I don't really know. Okay. Um, I would just look at those. Audioholics is a trustworthy site, and um, James does great stuff. Yeah, you can you can take a look at it and see what they recommend, and they're both at that same price point. If that's your budget, that's not a terrible way to go with those. Mm -hmm. But you know, it goes back to the whole discussion we had earlier. Mm -hmm. There are definitely tiers of subwoofers, probably yeah. more so than tiers of speakers. Mm -hmm. And a great subwoofer is so important to the to the 
functionality of the whole system, like the enjoyment of the whole system, that I I would probably advise you just to steer clear of those subs and just save your money until you can get something a little better. If you can't get something better, if 500 is the limit, yeah. then just do the research and figure out what those guys, you know, that have had both of their hands are using the same measurement gear. Mm -hmm. Probably pretty trustworthy to go with what they recommend on that between their two reviews. Yep. Yeah. So, I know, like, w I'll just expand a little bit further. We've had a couple different subwoofer shootouts, 2011, <laughs> 2012, and I've been to other states where I, I wasn't the host of those other ones, like 2013 and 2015. At any rate, there are, I say there are tiers. There's pretty distinct tiers. So we had subjective scoring systems. One of these was even blind. And it's almost like kind of the entry-level subwoofers might be at a two or three out of a five scale. Okay. And then you go to something like an HSU, an SVS, it's like a four tier you know, on a five scale. And it's almost like the whole group unanimously votes that even in a blind, like, all right, yeah. this is pretty good. You step up to something like a JTR and it, you're like, it's like, it's not just like incrementally better. It's yeah. not, it's a, not a diminishing return type thing. It's like, this is a clear five. I mean, this is like, this is way better. So where with speakers, you can have a diminishing returns a lot quicker than with subwoofers. Subwoofers, yeah. you have to have a certain amount of money involved in order to get the the size of the driver the magnetic structure that you need the amplifier that you need to really push the uh, the acoustic energy in the room that's, yeah. that's my opinion yeah so he's got 16 by 14 and uh, he said he may look at the rsl 12 look at the used market especially <laughs> for home built cabinets you may be surprised at what you can get like finding somebody that's put together 18 inch drivers with um 18s and cabinets from gsg and you'd be surprised at what those can go for on the used market and those yeah. would blow away anything that you're going to be able to get from a pre-manufactured 500 hundred dollar price point yeah yeah if somebody is, is the same guy going to this rsl 12 from the 15s we've been talking about i don't think that's Correct. a good move yeah yeah that's that some was of his... your size is very important and you don't want to go to a <clears throat> in the in the realm we're talking about where you want to be wowed by sub 20 hertz frequencies you don't yep. want a 12 inch driver you just yep. don't once i went 15 i never went backwards and then same thing with 18 so and i, uh, I I'm, I'm with you i don't have any experience with 15s the biggest oh. i've had is 13 the pb4000 i have and i that was a big jump that's for a me, great so. well, yeah. you know, it's, it's a great i, I love it but it's just I, gonna ruin you yeah, you're gonna be screwed, dude. You're, you'll you'll either never come back, or you're gonna. He's, want he's to gonna it. reenact what yeah. happened to me when I went over to Jonathan's room years ago. <laughs> you know what? You know what's gonna be fun though, Jordan. Honestly, is I can't wait to see your content from the event because what's cool is you're coming in, yes, as a content creator, but I want you to come as an enthusiast. Like Definitely. what? And just share what did you experience from the event, whether it's First time you ever experienced a near field subwoofer or the first time experiencing that 18 or multiple 18s or we're going to have some 24s there yeah, from stereo that's, integrity. That's, I can't even imagine what that. Yeah. That, you know, what, what does that, that experience like. look like? What does that feel like? Um, and especially these rooms are going to be massive, you know, big, big room. How big are they, Ryan? 1,400 square feet mm -hmm. or cubic feet? 1,400 square feet. Square feet. Okay. Um, so these are big 28 rooms. by 40. Yeah. Something like that. The, the rooms, rooms are, not... are 1400. Yeah. Yeah. At the Kansas city convention center. Yeah. They're huge. It's a little bit Dude, these are my house. They're like 15. <laughs> yeah. And they're 15 foot ceilings. So this is not a small room. Like I said, we're going to have something that, you know, most other, you know, um, conventions or AV shows are doing these in, in really, really small rooms, but, if they can fill the a big room like that and pressurize it, then you know it's going to be able to handle your 16 by 14 or your 24 by 34, whatever. I'm making up some dimensions. So, um, and but do, yeah. are you guys having any processors like Storm, Trinov, or Storm will be there? Storm will be there. I and mean, yeah. we have a room EQ comparison. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Where people are going to be able to compare Odyssey against Arc, against Dirac, against Room Perfect, <laughs> against YPOW. Yeah. against no calibration and see what they like. Yeah. Uh, we did that last year at M-Wave um, and we do it all in real time, even during mid clip. Mm -hmm. So it's a that's very, a nice yeah, there's that's, a lot of cool stuff yeah. that nobody think, else in the industry is doing. I think you're in for a treat, Jordan. I really, I'm, I'm so excited it. you're going to be there. Um, and again, even not even a content perspective, but literally just a personal perspective. 
and a lot of you guys that are coming, you're experiencing some things that you've never experienced before. And I just think that's so cool. And that's, that's, that's the heartbeat behind him wave. We truly want this to be the Midwest uh, AV experience. We want you to experience some things that are truly unique things that people aren't doing at other um, AV shows. Um, so yeah. So Brett says he's got dual 12s and they only go down to 33 Hertz. You're missing a ton of fun. I'll just be honest with you. Yep. So next goal, 20 Hertz, hundred percent. You can get a subwoofer down to 20 Hertz. I think that's a great, great start. Absolutely. To me, that's the minimum. Um, anything below that, man, it'll just, it'll increase the size of your smile. Absolutely. All right. Great question. Brett says, and I, I, you might be sarcastic here, maybe. What's a crossover? If not, simple version is the crossover is a setting maybe in your AVR or in the subwoofer that tells the... Or the speaker. Yeah, or the speaker. The signal that's coming in, what it can play, what frequencies it can play, and what it can't. So in the subwoofer world, you're talking about like typically 80 hertz and below. And so you don't want voices coming through the subwoofer. You don't want high frequencies coming through the subwoofer. Vice versa, inside a speaker, you've got a crossover. Sometimes they call it a network. And um, the high frequencies are diverted with a crossover to play to the tweeters. So they don't play any lower frequencies and vice versa on the mid range and, and lower frequencies. So it's probably a, could be a sarcastic question, but just in case somebody's watching this video and going, I don't know what a crossover is. Hopefully that explained it very simply. Supernova Moore says that AV10 is calling my name, but I just got, but I just dropping a grip on that NZ8. So I may have to wait a bit. Okay. So he just purchased the NZ8, it sounds like. So I'll, I'll add a comment about that. So yeah. at C, was it Cedia? I believe it was Cedia. My favorite room at that entire place was the, uh, I guess it's Massimo now, but they had the Amp 10. It was the first time they showed the Amp 10 and the AV 10, mm -hmm. and they had them mm -hmm. paired with the Bowers and Wilkins CT series. That room sounded, that was number one for me. Out of all the other, you know, hundreds of thousand million dollar rooms, that room rocked. Sounded absolutely incredible. So, yeah. I got two AV10s in stock. Nice. <clears throat> we can make that happen, Supernova. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, is a, it is a great one. Jonathan actually has one. Uh, yes, I'm Rance AV10. It's a solid piece of kit. There you go. And now with Dirac, it's doing even more. Speaking of that, I don't and I don't know if you guys can answer this or if you're allowed to. Do you know if the Storm Audio is going to be doing the uh, art? Yeah, that M wave. Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, we're allowed to answer that. Okay. I didn't know yeah. if it was like That's that's a goal. Matt Trinklin from Storm's been on here and talking about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That'll I just be there. I don't know if they were going to have it there, but yeah. Oh, it'll be there. That's really cool. Cuz it comes out before um, M wave happens. It'll be out yeah. on the Storm processors yeah. before that. So I'm did curious. They, did they move it up? I thought it was going to be like later in the year. May. <clears throat> mm, okay, cool. Next month. Nice. It's happening. Who all listens to reference level? I'm about 10 dB no. typically under <laughs> reference. Ryan is 10 dB over reference. <laughs> <laughs> Just with the subs. Yeah. Um, I normally yeah. listen at like music. It's close to reference. Mm -hmm. Movies probably about ten dB under. Mm -hmm. I'm about sixteen, but sixteen under. Okay. Uh, it did well. That it depends on if it's streaming or if it's like you know Blu-ray quality. Because streaming, you usually have to bump it up. Mm -hmm. So I'll go down to you know <clears throat> four negative fourteen. But okay. um, I I don't I don't want to listen to reference. I like my yeah. hearing. Yeah. Try a good recorded movie at reference and, and it's enjoyable, but a lot of movies are not great recordings. So like gravity is a key example. Gravity mm -hmm. at reference is a treat. It's yeah. well recorded so well. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you watch something that's wham bam B class mm -hmm. movie, it's like no, it's too much. Now yeah. I'll watch demo clips at reference correct. Yeah. Yeah. Hour yeah. Hour. yeah. But those are all high quality yeah. you know, clips that we've hand selected. True. 
Jeffrey says, thoughts on using low profile car subs integrated into the riser for some good near field base. So can you get near field out of that though? If they're directly under the seat, it might that, be arguable. Is that considered near field at that point? I think a 12 inch driver, which is typical well, you of be what you're, you're on the riser and the riser is going to be having shake. And I think you're bending some, some rules here. I think it will work pretty well. Have right. a right with subs I guess for it to be considered yeah, 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 yeah. a near field. I get sub. that, but have the near field feel of like what we have for near fields. I don't think you're going to get that. I don't think you'll get that slam. You'll get the shake. Yeah. But I don't think you'll get the the feel yeah. like John Wick shotgun shot yeah. going out and yeah. rupturing your spine. Yeah. I, think I don't it's just think gonna you're going to get that. I think you'll, I think you'll enjoy it a lot because I yeah. have experienced this at someone's house. He had yeah. 10, 12 yeah. inch subs built into his risers. Correct. And it was a lot of fun. And he didn't yeah. even have any other subs in the room. They were just the subs and the risers and it worked really well. Yeah. Um, is it exactly the same as near field? No, but none of these transducers are all the exact same. So sure. you'll enjoy it. Yes. If you want to do that, you'll enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's an awesome idea. And if you can do it, do it. Yeah. I play the podcast at reference level. <laughs> nice. Wow. Man, when Ryan was screaming earlier. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that's hilarious. That's a test clip. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Magic Lake says, hope you guys are doing well. We are. Um, can you please help me find some Speak for yourself, dealer Michael. who deals with JBL speakers? I can't find these. Second are the JBL. These models, outdoor speakers. Anybody know a dealer that sells JBL? Um, I know. Can I get those? I know uh -huh. Chris, that home theater dude, has going to have a video of, with some JBLs. I don't know, like, specifically the ones he's asking for, but I know the grid is going to be, so I can ask him if. Are those older JBLs, Jonathan? They're, they're still for sale. If you do a okay. web search on them, they're all over the place. Like, okay. everybody sells them. Okay. So um, you don't necessarily have to have a dealer. Save a little money with a dealer okay. if you get a friendly dealer. Okay. So yeah, yeah, offhand, don't know. I can get them. You can get them. They're special order, but okay. I can get them. I don't know right. how. I mean, I don't know how much I'm going to save anybody anything, but yeah. I can get them for sure. Okay. We'll shoot Ryan an email if you're interested. If you're still in the chat, JD, the expert youth man question could be a dumb one. Uh, just trying or just wondering. Okay, so we answered this one already. All right, move on. Thank you. Evangeliste, it's a different one. Answer right? this one. My goodness, how am I answering the same one? Someone because they asked him. the question multiple times. Oh. <laughs> Someone can Guys, come on now. Here. You ought to know us by now. I'm going in order unless they're a super chat. Those get bumped to the top, but other than that, we just go in the order. Try to at least. Jay says there's uh, there's no better home theater podcast on the internet. Appreciate it, brother. You three are terrific. I'm curious what three is terrific. Yeah, yeah. Which three? Yeah, not me. Tonight, bro. Obvious, <laughs> this is your show. Wow. Obviously not me. <laughs> Somebody just got run over the bus, man. No. Thanks for it's all right. I'm, I'm, I'm run guest. over constantly. I appreciate it, Jay. That's awesome. Man. We, we try to have fun. We try to be educational, answer your questions. Um, but yeah, man, we have a good time. Chris Contreras, any recommendations for a 7.2.4 AVR under three grand? There's probably a awesome. lot of them. There's a yeah, lot. There's the AVR run. Especially if you're able to power two channels with a dedicated amp. So throw out, throw out some model numbers. 7 out 2 4 is only 11 channels. You could you could have an amplifier built in all the way with like the... You could. I'm just saying yeah. how, like yeah. price yeah. points, it opens up quite a few other options. Pioneer, Onkyo, they've got some ones that got direct on them now. I think they're under three grand, right? Yes. Denon, Moran. Yeah. yeah. How much is a 3,800? Is that too much? No. no it's like seventeen no. or eighteen hundred, I think. Yeah, yeah, retails. yeah. Dude, there's there's so many options. I think I've got an open oh, box man. cinema fifty that needs a home. Okay. There you go. Dude, there's there yeah. You get a I smoking think, deal on that. I think there's a lot of opportunity there, Chris. So shoot Ryan an email. What does your house look like, Ryan? You just have like open box stuff everywhere. <laughs> no. <laughs> I I just have stuff in stock and I mean it's part of being a dealer. It's yeah, yeah. you gotta got buy it. Yeah, I've got several, cool. I've got a few racks in my garage of product nice. that I actually had to reorganize. So 
and uh, Massimo came through and did a training and I bought a bunch of stuff. So it's, I've got some extra stuff that I try and pass on mm -hmm. to people, especially the open box things to, to help people out. So that cinema 50 needs a home. It was the one that we used at training. It hasn't been, it's not like a return or anything. It was just opened and used at training. Yeah. And we were using it to go through some stuff and then it was put back in the box by Massimo. It'll have a full warranty and just needs to find a home. I like it. There you go. Are we going to uh, keep going? What's our what's our cutoff time tonight, fellas? Because I got to get off here pretty soon. Dude, jump off anytime you want. Yeah, you don't need to worry there's, about there's anything. Never. Oh, gosh, we're at three hours. Three hours. <laughs> I know you got carpets to five. clean, Jonathan. You got to go. Carpet cleaning time, man. <laughs> dude, you can bail anytime. Like, dude, at an hour, you can go, peace out. You, you'll never hurt our feelings. It just feels bad. Yeah, well, and you guys never stop talking, so I can't. <laughs> all, my, all of my family's asleep, so I'm. I'm my okay. family's asleep. Yeah, and, yeah, and Jordan, I'm, same thing. You can bail anytime, yeah. dude. You're probably I'll, like, oh I my can peace God. out with. John. No, I mean, I can stay up, but it. I mean, I do have to get up early for work, so and I have sleep apnea, so it's kind of like. Well, you need to get I some should, rest. I should, I should probably. <laughs> so we've got another ten questions. I'm not going to start anymore. We're going to handle those, me and Ryan. You I got no. You guys can peace out, man. Yeah, I'm going to take off. Good there's night, no, fellas. It's there's no guarantee that 10 ain't going to be another <laughs> hour. Yeah, right. not, yeah. yeah, Jordan, I've seen this before. There's 10 more questions. That's what I always say. I'll take it where I'm for just, you, Jonathan. I'm just trying to keep it real here, man. Jordan, thank you seriously. Hey, Appreciate thank you, you being man. on the channel tonight. Um, I love what you're doing on your channel. Go subscribe to Haterade <clears throat> Cowboy um, Cinema on his – I was trying to pull it up right here. Follow him on social He's covering a lot of trade shows, a lot of AV events. He'll be at M Wave. So we're looking forward to hanging out with you. And uh, cool, man. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks yeah. for having me on. We'll yeah. do this again. Sometime. We'll hit we'll hit the rest of these questions, me and Ryan. So right, you guys John, have a great night. Good night, Ryan. Michael. See you later. Thanks, everybody. All right. A few more questions here. PSA, is it like JTR? Similar, I think, in the subwoofers. My personal preference, I like the larger horns that JTR provides. Um, the PSA, at least most of the, I guess I've only heard one PSA um, MTM configuration, like the, you've got a, a woofer and then a tweeter and then a woofer. But it's, it's a similar of, design philosophy. Yeah, but the sound is, I think, quite a bit different, at least the series that I heard. I don't remember the model numbers. They both um, use compression drivers. They, JTR's it's a similar a idea. More, I just yeah. think it's different. It's yeah. not executed the same way. Yeah. I think their subwoofers are definitely comparable. Um, Tom's got mm. some great. Yeah. The one that I reviewed, again, I can only share my experience. I had a, a dual 18. That thing was a monster. First real, like, deep, deep hitting subwoofer. Um, I don't know what his current, the iPal subwoofers he's got now. Oh, those monsters. Mm -hmm. So he's yeah. got some big ones. So. Again, I can't speak for all of them, but I've, I can I can say this. I've heard probably 15 JTR systems, and I've been absolutely... all of them. No, whatever. I've been absolutely blown away with every one of those. There's not one that I walked away and went, hmm, that one struggled. It's like, holy cow, that put a big old grin in my face. So um, definitely a fan. We're excited. Jeff and JTR is going to be at M-Wave this year. So if you want to hear them, come out. Eric says I struggle with Apple TV through the Arkham AVR 11 to LG using eARC. Seems ATV, Apple TV forces AVR back, even if other HDMI input chosen example um, by the pause screen. It's irritating. I know eARC and ARC has some issues. They're not, it's not a, a great handshake all the time. Even on my system, sometimes I have to turn. Hell, ARC HDMI off. in general isn't a great um, handshake every time. Yeah. It's its own disaster. Yeah. So sometimes I have to turn it off and turn it back on and get it synced back up. But I don't know if I've got a great reason why it's happening in your setup. But I think that's there's some, it, I will general. say this, the newer stuff, at least with Arkham and some of the synthesis mm -hmm. AVRs I've working with mad VR, we've noticed some issues with handshakes mm -hmm. that can occur on yeah. their monitor outs. So yeah. That could be it. You may want to try it taking the Arkham mm -hmm. out of the equation, or if you can borrow from a local friend or something, you yeah. can see if like a Marantz or Denon behaves differently. But I've had experience with some Arkham and JPL or JBL 
AVR pre pros having some sync issues. Sure. JD, the expert, I have an amazing question. I love this. <laughs> Every I stream. I, I love it, dude. He's man. dedicated. He's, like, he's just letting you know, man, this ain't your average question. This is an amazing question. Normal question for me to ask. But what did you guys, youth man, have for dinner? Um, so we went over to my sister's house and we had um, some chicken like from Publix. It wasn't anything super fancy, but we had some homemade mashed potatoes. We had some homemade cake, beautiful cake. It was like a Reese's, no, a Snickers cake. Um, this lady made it. It was phenomenal. And then we had some homemade peach cobbler. It was, it was to die for. So, yeah, had a, that was my lunch. I haven't eaten dinner yet. So we're at 11 p.m. here. So that was at 5 p.m. That may have been a mistake. <laughs> that was early. So I'll probably I had it. Mexican food. I had I'll cheese and enchiladas. All right, let's keep going. John has a question. He says, uh, Jonathan, congrats on the new seats. Look great. Can we get some close ups oh, and feedback? We screwed so that up. That one. So, sorry, Jonathan, John. you have to get that one next time. So, he's excited about his new seats. He's going to bring them to M Wave, I hear. I'm going to, I'm going to he's not. cut into him. He's not. No, he's uh, not. All right. DCAS, do you think attendance is up at Axpona pre COVID? It wasn't bad. Again, I don't, I don't know what to compare it to. Some people said they felt that there were less people this year than last year. I know it wasn't they're dead. It was busy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm just saying, I think it was down from the previous years, but oh. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how many they, I'm sure there's thousands of people that go to Axpona. So honestly, I don't know. Hi, Mobius. Mo. Oh, wow. You can tell it's been a little while on the stream. Hi, Modulus. Sorry if this is doubled up question. Uh, didn't print in chat. Maybe didn't check in the chat. So how high can the U mic or Omni mic read SPL? Great question. When do you need to go to a commercial grade stuff? I think to me, the bigger question is why do you need to read super, super, super loud? Just be careful, I guess is my thing. I mean, if you need something that is louder than the U mic one or Omni mic on SPLs, you're probably Scott newbie level and he has a professional calibration microphone. But he's also trying oh, he to get a professional SPL meter. That's what I meant. I, I, yeah, sorry. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know why. I mean, these are measurement microphones it's, typically. So Google says 133 dB on the U mic, which is insanely loud. So I mean, unless you're just trying to see how loud yours can go. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's really loud. That is, that's yeah. You're gonna damage hearing at that. So just be careful. That's that's my biggest warning. Joey G's audio channel. Quick one. Anyone blow the plate amp or 12 inch woofer inside a uh, PV 1000 non Bluetooth? Will they send me a replacement parts under warranty without having to ship that box back? So yes, I don't know. Best my thing just is SVS would either send you a replacement amp. I mean, they're not going to want to ship it because it costs no. them more money because it's yeah. a bigger box. Yep. So like with the manufacturers that I deal with as a dealer, what will mm -hmm. typically happen is they'll send you parts and repair guides to be able to fix it on site because yeah. it's too expensive to ship that. And a lot of this stuff yeah. isn't overly complex to be able sure. to screw on in. The it's just the design of the screen. drivers, design of the cabinets, mm -hmm. design of the DSP and the amplifier. Yeah. That's a big part of what you're paying for. And it's not hard to put back together or to hook a speaker yeah. up. Sure. One thing I can say about SVS, they are tremendous on customer service. So definitely just reach out to them. Those guys are superb, man. I love what the SVS is doing in, in the space, home theater, um, and two channel. But but I think they'll take care of you, especially being only five months old. So just reach out to them. Pitts says, how much money do each of you have in your systems? <laughs> all right my wife watches my stream so we won't go to that question um yeah i mean it all depends you know i mean all of us have different levels of of gear let me yeah. hold on i'll figure it out <laughs> just give him this. i think mine was when i when i look at total msrp we're talking over probably between 80 to 100 grand i think um but I haven't even done the math. I don't want to know. <laughs> so um, it's going to take me a minute. Yeah. 
So now I, I don't have that much invested in mine, full disclosure. I mean, I've had brands, certain ones, that, and I disclose that on my channel. Sometimes they'll send me gear um, or they'll send me, um, you know, like my theater seats. Valencia has sponsored. So uh, that definitely saved me some money there. But if I had to go by MSRP, you're probably, yeah, probably 90 to maybe even over 100. So it's quite on up there. $1 million. Not, not even close, Brett, by any means. All right, Ryan's doing the math on his. I'll go to the next question. I screwed mine up. Schmock91 says, hey, guys, a bit late to the stream, so sorry if this has been covered already. What would you recommend? Uh, let's see. So between the X6700H or the SR8015. So I like both of those. I reviewed, I think I reviewed the 6400. Um, I love the SR8015 from Marantz. It's a beast. It's got a massive power supply in it. I think that's solid. Um, I reviewed the 6400H, so I haven't reviewed the 6700H. I think both of those are great options, honestly. They'll both support 7.2.4. My question, though, would be why go why go for those when they're not current generation? True. I mean, I know there's the 6800 isn't out for Denon yet, but why mm -hmm. go for like the 8015 yeah, instead right. of a cinema series? Is it yeah. price point? Like, is somebody closing them out? Are they on accessories for less? Um, What's going on there? Yeah. Uh, mine, my theater's encroaching on too much. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was going to be a lot. I think it's like, yeah. so again, we're talking 250. Full, full Holy crap. Something like that. Well, I've got $30,000 just in subwoofers. Yeah, sure. So, yeah. I mean, three of them aren't here yet. And guys, remember, I am a dealer. So this yeah. isn't right. like and I do this okay. for a living. So it's MSRP for it. It's so. you guys need to remember, don't compare yourself because this is my showroom. Yeah. And I realize mm -hmm. that my showroom's far above what yeah. a lot of other guys have, but yeah, I do this for a living. I so. think some people they're just they're curious though. Yeah, you know, it's it's, it's like, around 250. It's it's crazy how many times I get that question on I'll do a home theater tour and they're like, Yeah, but how much did he spend? And partially, honestly, that's it's kind of a personal question, but in a way, you can do the math. I mean. I put the list of their equipment. You can go to Google and figure out how much do these speakers and how much does that receiver and how much do this, you know, the projector cost. But I think people are just genuinely curious. Yeah. When they see something like yeah. that home theater gamer. What is up, Brad? Good to see you, buddy. He said, I just bought a Denon 6,300 from a friend for 500 bucks. Youth man deal. I love it, man. Yeah. He's he getting the, yeah, 2,500. What is the 8015, though? It's a 11.2 channel AVR. I reviewed it. It's about three years old, though, like Ryan said. I mean, it's not like it's yeah. outdated. It still has Dolby Atmos. It, it's got all the current formats. Like, that's not going to have HDMI 2.1. <clears throat> no. It's that's not true. going to have Dirac. Um, what would the compar comparator to that be? Like, the Cinema... All right, so but truth be known, does the any of the cinema series right now have direct? Yes, it's out. Built in? Okay. Well, you it's an extra, but yeah, you can get but it. But I mean it extra. well, I, I mean it's available though. Yes. I yeah, okay. I couldn't remember when they when they released that or when no, they it's released. out. Uh so the cinema Damn that's question. nine. Continue. What how many channels did he want to power for this? Uh seven point two point four. So 11, 11 you could speakers. spend a lot less than that. Do you like the cinema 50 or a Denon 3,800 or something and then get a two channel amplifier. Correct. And those are spanking new. They don't have 11 internal amps, but they have right. nine. And then okay. you can run an external amplifier on it. And then you're at your 11 needed channels. Then you get four sub outs instead of two. That right yeah. there is big. Yeah. That right that there is big. Okay, so I agree. I think the four sub outs is way bigger than HDMI 2.1. Yes. Because you can still go straight into your display if you're wanting to do 2.1. Yes. And bypass the AVR. Um, I, I do like the, the benefit of having the four Like a outs. Denon 3800, a Marant Cinema 50. I mean, mm -hmm. all of those are going to be able to deliver on that same premise with four subwoofer outs. You need an external amplifier, but you can... Like yeah. if you bought, let's say you got theoretically a 3,800 through me. I mean, you could get a, I'd sell a Behringer 800 for like 200 bucks. 
There you go. That's two channels of roughly 300 watts a channel, class D. Yeah. So yeah. you'd be well under that yeah. $2,500 price point. Yeah. So Christian, so the SR8015, technically, it's probably still kind of current as far as they may still sell it, but pretty much the cinema series has replaced mm -hmm. um, that, that series, the SR series. So... Uh, glad you're enjoying your time here, man. He said, I'm loving this stream. Kind of tired, but I'm still here. I'm tired. Dude, you're 17 years old. You should have, you should be like the Energizer Bunny. Go yeah, you should days. be like cracked out on Mountain Dew and yeah. all kinds of stuff right now. And brother, I'm like 46 years old. I'm still going strong. I'm, I'm good to go. Do this all night. Not going to, but I could. So, uh, 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 uh. a couple more questions here. Is there, yeah, we already did that one in the venue. See Big, good to see you, man. I'm interested in the Marantz Amp 10, but would like to pair it with a Parasound A31, which that's a beast of an amp for my front sound stage. Would this work? 100% it would work. Yeah, it would. Parasound is rock solid. The Marantz A uh, Amp 10 is really solidly built. Marantz yeah. did some work on that amplifier. Yeah. Man, you guys are asking all the questions about stuff. Yeah. Seriously, if you guys need stuff, yeah, let me know. I, I'm pretty sure um, Charles has got his set up for the. No, he says, hang on. Is it an amp tin? Yeah. Oh, okay. So he's basically That's saying the... he's wanting to pair. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You're totally fine having two different amplifiers. That's from not two a problem. Companies. Yeah. Pair it down the solid. A31 is a fantastic amplifier yeah. built to survive a. World War. The Amp 10 Marantz did an amazing job with it. Yeah. I, I think when I initially read that, I was thinking of the Cinema 10. And I'm like, mm. oh, yeah, that'd work fine. But either way. Yeah. I mean, if you yeah. meant the AV10, it would work. Either would work fine. Correct. With the yeah. A31. thirty-one. Ryan says, I want to ask if it would be worth buying two more subwoofers. Always. <laughs> I'm take, uh, let's see, I'm talking. Uh, okay. So he's looking at a pair of either. PB 4000 from SVS or PB 16 to go with the PB 3000 subwoofers in his 9.2.6 theater powered by Denon A1H. Yes. I'm a fan of multiple subwoofers. So, um, for I guess part, larger number than two. So, yes. Yeah. I mean, part of the question is, you know, how big is your room? How loud do you listen? Um, mm. are you trying to get, well, I mean, think about this. If this is in his bedroom, he doesn't need four subwoofers. He's going yeah. after the frequency response. Yeah, but still. Yeah. You're not going to change diminishing returns, but yeah. So, but that I guess that's where I'm going with that. So I would yeah, not I'm a fan of four subwoofers, sure. Just make sure you do not mix sealed with ported. Yeah. It can be done. It's just not real easy. Oh, it can be done. It just took me like three days to do it. Yeah. It yeah. It's just a pain. So he's talking well, but he, he mentioned all ported i'm just giving him a warning. Okay. okay i thought maybe he mentioned it in there all right uh, da, 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 da. mixing pb4000 with the pb3000 is fine absolutely question for ryan do i get a negative 13 hertz demo and for youth fans they're going to be the jd burt jd the expert subwoofers at m wave yes sir man come on uh, da, 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 da. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Anything else you see? No, we got a couple of. We got most of the questions. Uh, uh, Christian asked another question about you can get two monolith <clears throat> M8125X and have change left over for the amp 10. Is the monolith M8125, is that an amplifier? Yeah, I think so. 80, it's one of their new amplifiers. I'm not familiar with it. So monolith. My recommendation is just shoot me an email because I think it's going to be better for us to have a phone conversation about this and go through a bunch of different things and see if we can get to the bottom of what you're trying to do, what your speakers are. Um, That's an 8 by 100 amp, yeah. $1,500. I think we want to just go through some stuff and make sure mm -hmm. what you're looking at is what's going to work for your room. Yeah, and make the most sense. Really easy, quick question here. What does pressurizing a room with subwoofers mean? Basically means that you've got enough surface area on your subwoofers to physically feel the pressure in the room changing. 
So and like, you'll know if you've experienced it before because it's going to feel no. heavy. But that's that's when the fun begins. Yes. Yeah. It's going to feel like the air is now thicker is yeah. what it's going to feel like. Yeah. What are you running near field right now? Is it the JTRs? It's a RS1. Okay. JTR. Technically, that's... No. RS1 is the JTRs. Yeah. I was thinking the RTJ series. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, guys, we're at three and a half hours, so I uh, think... Um, what's that? Oh. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. These get longer and longer. They do, but it's fun. But, it's worth yeah. it. Oh, we enjoy it, man. Enjoy hanging out with you guys. Launch codes. Michael, what do you think of the Yamo? I have no experience at all with Yamo at all. So couldn't tell you there. So, well, cool, guys. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up here. Appreciate y'all hanging out with us. Hopefully, you guys can make it out to M-Wave. We're going to have a blast. Ryan and I are putting on an event, an AV event, July 14th through the 16th. Check out all the details at Midwest AV Experience. It was great seeing a lot of the regulars here tonight. We saw some new folks. Um, and we're still 120 people hanging out with us right now. So mm -hmm. if you enjoyed the the uh, the stream, hit the like on your way out. Have a great week, guys. And I'll be having some more content coming your way this week. So God bless. Y'all take care. See you guys later. Have a good